Chapter 18 of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 18 The Jungle Toll. Early the next morning Tarzan awoke, and his first thought of the new day, as the last of yesterday, was of the wonderful writing which lay hidden in his quiver. Hurriedly he brought it forth, hoping against hope that he could read what the beautiful white girl had written there the preceding evening. At the first glance he suffered a bitter disappointment. Never before had he so yearned for anything as now he did for the ability to interpret a message from that golden-haired divinity who had come so suddenly and so unexpectedly into his life. What did it matter if the message were not intended for him? It was an expression of her thoughts, and that was sufficient for Tarzan of the Apes. And now to be baffled by strange, uncouth characters the like of which he had never seen before. Why, they even tipped in the opposite direction from all that he had ever examined, either in printed books or the difficult script of the few letters he had found. Even the little bugs of the black book were familiar friends, though their arrangement meant nothing to him, but these bugs were new and unheard of. For twenty minutes he pored over them, when suddenly they commenced to take familiar, though distorted shapes. Ah, they were his old friends, but badly crippled. Then he began to make out a word here and a word there. His heart leaped for joy. He could read it, and he would. In another half hour he was progressing rapidly, and but for an exceptional word now and again he found it very plain sailing. Here is what he read. West coast of Africa, about ten degrees south latitude, so Mr. Clayton says, February 3, question mark, 1909. Dearest Hazel, it seems foolish to write you a letter that you may never see, but I simply must tell somebody of our awful experiences since we sailed from Europe on the ill-fated arrow. If we never return to civilization, as now seems only too likely, this will at least prove a brief record of the events which led up to our final fate, whatever it may be. As you know, we were supposed to have set out upon a scientific expedition to the Congo, Papa was presumed to entertain some wondrous theory of an unthinkably ancient civilization, the remains of which lay buried somewhere in the Congo Valley. But after we were well under sail, the truth came out. It seems that an old bookworm who has a book and curio shop in Baltimore discovered between the leaves of a very old Spanish manuscript a letter written in 1550 detailing the adventures of a crew of mutineers of a Spanish galleon bound from Spain to South America, with a vast treasure of doubloons and pieces of eight, I suppose, for they certainly sound weird in piratey. The writer had been one of the crew, and the letter was to his son, who was, at the very time the letter was written, master of a Spanish merchantman. Many years had elapsed since the events the letter narrated had transpired, and the old man had become a respected citizen of an obscure Spanish town, but the love of gold was still so strong upon him that he risked all to acquaint his son with the means of obtaining fabulous wealth for them both. The writer told how, when but a week out from Spain, the crew had mutinied and murdered every officer and man who opposed them, but they defeated their own ends by this very act, for there was none left competent to navigate a ship at sea. They were blown hither and thither for two months, until, sick and dying of scurvy, starvation, and thirst, they had been wrecked on a small islet. The galleon was washed high upon the beach where she went to pieces, but not before the survivors, who numbered but ten souls, had rescued one of the great chests of treasure. This they buried well up on the island, and for three years they lived there in constant hope of being rescued. One by one they sickened and died, until only one man was left, the writer of the letter. The men had built a boat from the wreckage of the galleon, but having no idea where the island was located, 
they had not dared to put it to sea. When all were dead except himself, however, the awful loneliness so weighed upon the mind of the sole survivor that he could endure it no longer, and choosing to risk death upon the open sea rather than madness on the lonely isle, he set sail in his little boat after nearly a year of solitude. Fortunately he sailed due north, and within a week was in the track of the Spanish merchantmen plying between the West Indies and Spain, and was picked up by one of these vessels homeward bound. The story he told was merely one of shipwreck in which all but a few had perished, the balance except himself dying after they reached the island. He did not mention the mutiny or the chest of buried treasure. The master of the merchantmen assured him that from the position at which they had picked him up, and the prevailing winds for the past week, he could have been on no other island than one of the Cape Verde group which lie off the west coast of Africa in about sixteen or seventeen degrees north latitude. His letter described the island minutely, as well as the location of the treasure, and was accompanied by the crudest, funniest little old map you ever saw, with trees and rocks all marked by scrawly X's to show the exact spot where the treasure had been buried. When Papa explained the real nature of the expedition, my heart sank for I know so well how visionary and impractical the poor dear has always been that I feared that he had again been duped, especially when he told me he had paid a thousand dollars for the letter and map. To add to my distress, I learned that he had borrowed ten thousand dollars more from Robert Candler, and had given his notes for the amount. Mr. Candler had asked for no security, and you know, dearie, what that will mean for me if Papa cannot meet them. Oh, how I detest that man! We all tried to look on the bright side of things, but Mr. Philander and Mr. Clayton, he joined us in London just for the adventure, both felt as skeptical as I. Well, to make a long story short, we found the island and the treasure, a great iron-bound oak chest, wrapped in many layers of oiled sailcloth, and as strong and firm as when it had been buried nearly two hundred years ago. It was simply filled with gold coin, and was so heavy that four men bent underneath its weight. The horrid thing seems to bring nothing but murder and misfortune to those who have anything to do with it. For three days after we sailed from the Cape Verde Islands, our own crew mutinied and killed every one of their officers. Oh, it was the most terrifying experience one could imagine. I cannot even write of it. They were going to kill us, too but one of them, the leader, named King, would not let them, and so they sailed south along the coast to a lonely spot where they found a good harbor, and here they landed and have left us. They sailed away with the treasure today, but Mr. Clayton says they will meet with a fate similar to the mutineers of the ancient galleon, because King, the only man aboard who knew aught of navigation, was murdered on the beach by one of the men the day we landed. I wish you could know Mr. Clayton. He is the dearest fellow imaginable, and unless I am mistaken he has fallen very much in love with me. He is the only son of Lord Greystoke, and some day will inherit the title and estates. In addition, he is wealthy in his own right, but the fact that he is going to be an English lord makes me very sad. You know what my sentiments have always been relative to American girls who married titled foreigners. Oh, if he were only a plain American gentleman. But it isn't his fault, poor fellow, and in everything except birth he would do credit to my country, and that is the greatest compliment I know how to pay any man. We have had the most weird experiences since we were landed here. Papa and Mr. Philander lost in the jungle and chased by a real lion. Mr. Clayton lost and attacked twice by wild beasts. Esmeralda and I cornered in an old cabin by a perfectly awful man-eating lioness. Oh, it was simply terrifical, as Esmeralda would say. But the strangest part of it all is the wonderful creature who rescued us. I have not seen him, but Mr. Clayton and Papa and Mr. Philander have, and they say that he is a perfectly godlike white man, tanned to a dusky brown, with the strength of a wild elephant, the agility of a monkey and the bravery of a lion. 
he speaks no English, and vanishes as quickly and as mysteriously after he has performed some valorous deed as though he were a disembodied spirit. Then we have another weird neighbor, who printed a beautiful sign in English and tacked it on the door of his cabin, which we have preempted, warning us to destroy none of his belongings and signing himself Tarzan of the Apes. We have never seen him, though we think he is about, for one of the sailors who was going to shoot Mr. Clayton in the back received a spear in his shoulder from some unseen hand in the jungle. The sailors left us but a meager supply of food, so as we have only a single revolver with but three cartridges left in it, we do not know how we can procure meat, though Mr. Philander says that we can exist indefinitely on the wild fruit and nuts which abound in the jungle. I am very tired now, so I shall go to my funny bed of grasses which Mr. Clayton gathered for me, but will add to this from day to day as things happen. Lovingly, Jane Porter. To Hazel Strong, Baltimore, Maryland. Tarzan sat in a brown study for a long time after he finished reading the letter. It was filled with so many new and wonderful things that his brain was in a whirl as he attempted to digest them all. So they did not know that he was Tarzan of the Apes. He would tell them. In his tree he had constructed a rude shelter of leaves and boughs, beneath which, protected from the rain, he had placed a few treasures brought from the cabin. Among these were some pencils. He took one, and beneath Jane Porter's signature he wrote, I am Tarzana of the Apes. He thought that would be sufficient. Later he would return the letter to the cabin. In the matter of food, thought Tarzan, they had no need to worry. He would provide, and he did. The next morning Jane found her missing letter in the exact spot from which it had disappeared two nights before. She was mystified, but when she saw the printed words beneath her signature, she felt a cold, clammy chill run up her spine. She showed the letter, or rather the last sheet with the signature, to Clayton. "'And to think,' she said, "'that uncanny thing was probably watching me all the time that I was writing. Ooh, it makes me shudder just to think of it.' "'But he must be friendly,' reassured Clayton for he has returned your letter, nor did he offer to harm you, and unless I am mistaken he left a very substantial memento of his friendship outside the cabin door last night, for I just found the carcass of a wild boar there as I came out. From then on scarcely a day passed that did not bring its offering of game or other food. Sometimes it was a young deer, again a quantity of strange cooked food, cassava cakes pilfered from the village of Mabonga or a boar, or leopard, and once a lion. Tarzan derived the greatest pleasure of his life in hunting meat for these strangers. It seemed to him that no pleasure on earth could compare with laboring for the welfare and protection of the beautiful white girl. Some day he would venture into the camp in daylight and talk with these people through the medium of the little bugs which were familiar to them and to Tarzan but he found it difficult to overcome the timidity of the wild thing of the forest, and so day followed day without seeing a fulfillment of his good intentions. The party in the camp, emboldened by familiarity, wandered farther and yet farther into the jungle in search of nuts and fruit. Scarcely a day passed that did not find Professor Porter straying in his preoccupied indifference towards the jaws of death. Mr. Samuel T. Philander, never what one might call robust, was worn to the shadow of a shadow through the ceaseless worry and mental distraction resultant from his Herculean efforts to safeguard the professor. A month passed. Tarzan had finally determined to visit the camp by daylight. It was early afternoon. Clayton had wandered to the point at the harbor's mouth to look for passing vessels. Here he kept a great mass of wood, high-piled, ready to be ignited as a signal should a steamer or a sail top the far horizon. Professor Porter was wandering along the beach south of the camp with Mr. Philander at his elbow, urging him to turn his steps back before the two became again the sport of some savage beast. The others gone, Jane and Esmeralda had wandered into the jungle to gather fruit, 
and in their search were led farther and farther from the cabin. Tarzan waited in silence before the door of the little house until they should return. His thoughts were of the beautiful white girl. They were always of her now. He wondered if she would fear him, and the thought all but caused him to relinquish his plan. He was rapidly becoming impatient for her return, that he might feast his eyes upon her and be near her, perhaps touch her. The ape-man knew no god, but he was as near to worshipping his divinity as mortal man ever comes to worship. While he waited he passed the time printing a message to her, whether he intended giving it to her he himself could not have told, but he took infinite pleasure in seeing his thoughts expressed in print, in which he was not so uncivilized after all. He wrote, I am Tarzan of the apes. I want you. I am yours. You are mine. We live here together always in my house. I will bring you the best of fruits, the tenderest deer, the finest meats that roam the jungle. I will hunt for you. I am the greatest of the jungle fighters. I will fight for you. I am the mightiest of the jungle fighters. You are Jane Porter. I saw it in your letter. When you see this you will know that it is for you, and that Tarzan of the Apes loves you." As he stood, straight as a young Indian, by the door, waiting after he had finished the message, there came to his keen ears a familiar sound. It was the passing of a great ape through the lower branches of the forest. For an instant he listened intently, and then from the jungle came the agonized scream of a woman and Tarzan of the Apes, dropping his first love letter upon the ground, shot like a panther into the forest. Clayton also heard the scream, and Professor Porter and Mr. Philander, and in a few minutes they came panting to the cabin, calling out to each other a volley of excited questions as they approached. A glance within confirmed their worst fears. Jane and Esmeralda were not there. Instantly Clayton, followed by the two old men, plunged into the jungle, calling the girl's name aloud. For half an hour they stumbled on, until Clayton by merest chance came upon the prostrate form of Esmeralda. He stopped beside her, feeling for her pulse, and then listening for her heartbeats. She lived. He shook her. Esmeralda! he shrieked in her ear. Esmeralda, for God's sake, where is Miss Porter? What has happened? Esmeralda! Slowly Esmeralda opened her eyes. She saw Clayton. She saw the jungle about her. Oh, Gabriel! She screamed and fainted again. By this time Professor Porter and Mr. Philander had come up. What shall we do, Mr. Clayton? asked the old professor. Where shall we look? God could not have been so cruel as to take my little girl away from me now. We must arouse Esmeralda first, replied Clayton. She can tell us what has happened. Esmeralda, he cried again, shaking the black woman roughly by the shoulder. Oh, Gabrielle, I want to die, cried the poor woman, but with eyes fast closed. Let me die, dear Lord, don't let me see that awful face again. Come, come, Esmeralda, cried Clayton. The Lord isn't here, it's Mr. Clayton. Open your eyes. Esmeralda did as she was bade. Oh, Gabriel, thank the Lord, she said. Where's Miss Porter? What happened? questioned Clayton. Ain't Miss Jane here? cried Esmeralda, sitting up with wonderful celerity for one of her bulk. Oh, Lord, now I remember. It must have took her away. And the negress commenced to sob and wail her lamentations. What took her away? cried Professor Porter. A great big giant all covered with hair. A gorilla, Esmeralda? questioned Mr. Philander, and the three men scarcely breathed as he voiced the horrible thought. I thought it was the devil, but I guess it must have been one of them gorillaphants. Oh, my poor baby, my poor little honey. And again Esmeralda broke into uncontrollable sobbing. Clayton immediately began to look about for tracks but he could find nothing save a confusion of trampled grasses in the close vicinity, and his woodcraft was too meager for the translation of what he did see. All the balance of the day they sought through the jungle. 
but as night drew on they were forced to give up in despair and hopelessness, for they did not even know in what direction the thing had borne Jane. It was long after dark ere they reached the cabin, and a sad and grief-stricken party it was that sat silently within the little structure. Professor Porter finally broke the silence. His tones were no longer those of the erudite pedant, theorizing upon the abstract and the unknowable, but those of the man of action, determined, but tinged also by a note of indescribable hopelessness and grief which wrung an answering pang from Clayton's heart. "'I shall lie down now,' said the old man, "'and try to sleep. Early tomorrow, as soon as it is light, I shall take what food I can carry, and continue the search until I have found Jane. I will not return without her.' His companions did not reply at once. Each was immersed in his own sorrowful thoughts, and each knew, as did the old professor, what the last words meant. Professor Porter would never return from the jungle. At length Clayton arose and laid his hand gently upon Professor Porter's bent old shoulder. "'I shall go with you, of course,' he said. "'I knew that you would offer, that you would wish to go, Mr. Clayton, but you must not. Jane is beyond human assistance now. What was once my dear little girl shall not lie alone and friendless in the awful jungle. The same vines and leaves will cover us, the same rains beat upon us, and when the spirit of her mother is abroad it will find us together in death, as it has always found us in life. No, it is I alone who may go, for she was my daughter, all that was left on earth for me to love. I shall go with you said Clayton simply. The old man looked up, regarding the strong, handsome face of William Cecil Clayton intently. Perhaps he read there the love that lay in the heart beneath, the love for his daughter. He had been too preoccupied with his own scholarly thoughts in the past to consider the little occurrences, the chance words, which would have indicated to a more practical man that these young people were being drawn more and more closely to one another. Now they came back to him, one by one. "'As you wish,' he said. "'You may count on me also,' said Mr. Flander. "'No, my dear old friend,' said Professor Porter. "'We may not all go. It would be cruelly wicked to leave poor Esmeralda here alone, and three of us would be no more successful than one. There be enough dead things in the cruel forest as it is. Come.' Let us try to sleep a little. End of chapter Chapter 19 of Tarzan of the Apes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 19 The Call of the Primitive From the time Tarzan left the tribe of great anthropoids in which he had been raised, it was torn by continual strife and discord. Turcos proved a cruel and capricious king, so that, one by one, many of the older and weaker apes, upon whom he was particularly prone to vent his brutish nature, took their families, and sought the quiet and safety of the far interior. But at last those who remained were driven to desperation by the continued truculence of Turcos, and it so happened that one of them recalled the parting admonition of Tarzan. If you have a chief who is cruel, do not do as the other apes do, and attempt any one of you to pit yourself against him alone. But, instead, let two or three or four of you attack him together. Then, if you will do this, no chief will dare to be other than he should be, for four of you can kill any chief who may ever be over you. And the ape who recalled this wise counsel repeated it to several of his fellows, so that when Turcos returned to the tribe that day, he found a warm reception awaiting him. There were no formalities. As Turcos reached the group, five huge hairy beasts sprang upon him. 
At heart he was an arrant coward, which is the way with bullies among apes as well as among men, so he did not remain to fight and die, but tore himself away from them as quickly as he could, and fled into the sheltering boughs of the forest. Two more attempts he made to rejoin the tribe, but on each occasion he was set upon and driven away. At last he gave it up, and turned, foaming with rage and hatred, into the jungle. For several days he wandered aimlessly, nursing his spite and looking for some weak thing on which to vent his pent anger. It was in this state of mind that the horrible, man-like beast, swinging from tree to tree, came suddenly upon two women in the jungle. He was right above them when he discovered them. The first intimation Jane Porter had of his presence was when the great hairy body dropped to the earth beside her, and she saw the awful face and the snarling hideous mouth thrust within a foot of her. One piercing scream escaped her lips as the brute hand clutched her arm. Then she was dragged toward those awful fangs which yawned at her throat. But ere they touched that fair skin, another mood claimed the anthropoid. The tribe had kept his women. He must find others to replace them. This hairless white ape would be the first of his new household, and so he threw her roughly across his broad hairy shoulders and leaped back into the trees, bearing Jane away. Esmeralda's scream of terror had mingled once with that of Jane, and then, as was Esmeralda's manner under stress of emergency which required presence of mind, she swooned. But Jane did not once lose consciousness. It is true that that awful face, pressing close to hers, and the stench of the foul breath beating upon her nostrils, paralyzed her with terror. But her brain was clear, and she comprehended all that transpired. With what seemed to her marvelous rapidity the brute bore her through the forest, but still she did not cry out or struggle. The sudden advent of the ape had confused her to such an extent that she thought now that he was bearing her toward the beach. For this reason she conserved her energies and her voice, until she could see that they had approached near enough to the camp to attract the succor she craved. She could not have known it, but she was being borne farther and farther into the impenetrable jungle. The scream that had brought Clayton and the two older men stumbling through the undergrowth had led Tarzan of the apes straight to where Esmeralda lay, but it was not Esmeralda in whom his interest centered, though pausing over her he saw that she was unhurt. For a moment he scrutinized the ground below and the trees above until the ape that was in him by virtue of training and environment, combined with the intelligence that was his by right of birth, told his wondrous woodcraft the whole story as plainly as though he had seen the thing happen with his own eyes. And then he was gone again into the swaying trees, following the high-flung spoor which no other human eye could have detected, much less translated. At bow's ends, where the anthropoid swings from one tree to another, there is most to mark the trail, but least to point the direction of the quarry, for there the pressure is downward always, toward the small end of the branch, whether the ape be leaving or entering a tree. Nearer the center of the tree, where the signs of passage are fainter, the direction is plainly marked. Here on this branch a caterpillar has been crushed by the fugitive's great foot, and Tarzan knows instinctively where that same foot would touch in the next stride. Here he looks to find a tiny particle of the demolished larva, oft-times not more than a speck of moisture. Again a minute bit of bark has been upturned by the scraping hand, and the direction of the break indicates the direction of the passage. Or some great limb, or the stem of the tree itself, has been brushed by the hairy body, and a tiny shred of hair tells him by the direction from which it is wedged beneath the bark that he is on the right trail. Nor does he need to check his speed to catch these seemingly faint records of the fleeing beast. To Tarzan they stand out boldly against all the myriad other scars and bruises and signs upon the leafy way. But strongest of all is the scent, for Tarzan is pursuing up the wind, and his trained nostrils are as sensitive as a hound's. There are those who believe that the lower orders are specially endowed by nature with better olfactory nerves than man but it is merely a matter of development. 
Man's survival does not hinge so greatly upon the perfection of his senses. His power to reason has relieved them of many of their duties, and so they have, to some extent, atrophied, as have the muscles which move the ears and scalp, merely from this use. The muscles are there, about the ears and beneath the scalp, and so are the nerves which transmit sensations to the brain, but they are underdeveloped because they are not needed. Not so with Tarzan of the Apes. From early infancy his survival had depended upon acuteness of eyesight, hearing, smell, touch, and taste, far more than upon the more slowly developed organ of reason. The least developed of all in Tarzan was the sense of taste, for he could eat luscious fruits or raw flesh long buried with almost equal appreciation but in that he differed but slightly from more civilized epicures. Almost silently the ape-man sped on in the track of Turkos and his prey, but the sound of his approach reached the ears of the fleeing beast and spurred it on to greater speed. Three miles were covered before Tarzan overtook them, and then Turkos, seeing that further flight was futile, dropped to the ground in a small open glade that he might turn and fight for his prize, or be free to escape unhampered if he saw that the pursuer was more than a match for him. He still grasped Jane in one great arm as Tarzan bounded like a leopard into the arena which nature had provided for this primeval-like battle. When Turkoz saw that it was Tarzan who pursued him, he jumped to the conclusion that this was Tarzan's woman, since they were of the same kind, white and hairless and so he rejoiced at this opportunity for double revenge upon his hated enemy. To Jane the strange apparition of this godlike man was as wine to sick nerves. From the description which Clayton and her father and Mr. Philander had given her, she knew that it must be the same wonderful creature who had saved them, and she saw in him only a protector and a friend. But as Turkoz pushed her roughly aside to meet Tarzan's charge, and she saw the great proportions of the ape, and the mighty muscles, and the fierce fangs, her heart quailed. How could any vanquish such a mighty antagonist? Like two charging bulls they came together, and like two wolves sought each other's throat. Against the long canines of the ape was pitted the thin blade of the man's knife. Jane, her lithe young form flattened against the trunk of a great tree, her hands tightly pressed against her rising and falling bosom, and her eyes wide with mingled horror, fascination, fear, and admiration, watched the primordial ape battle with the primeval man for possession of a woman, for her. As the great muscles of the man's back and shoulders knotted beneath the tension of his efforts, and the huge biceps and forearm held at bay those mighty tusks, the veil of centuries of civilization and culture were swept from the blurred vision of the Baltimore girl. When the long knife drank deep a dozen times of Turkoz's heart's blood, and the great carcass rolled lifeless upon the ground, it was a primeval woman who sprang forward with outstretched arms toward the primeval man who had fought for her and won her. And Tarzan? He did what no red-blooded man needs lessons in doing. He took his woman in his arms, and smothered her upturned, panting lips with kisses. For a moment Jane lay there with half-closed eyes. For a moment, the first in her young life, she knew the meaning of love. But as suddenly as the veil had been withdrawn, it dropped again, and an outraged conscience suffused her face with its scarlet mantle, and a mortified woman thrust Tarzan of the apes from her, and buried her face in her hands. Tarzan had been surprised when he had found the girl he had learned to love, after a vague and abstract manner, a willing prisoner in his arms. Now he was surprised that she repulsed him. He came close to her once more, and took hold of her arm. She turned upon him like a tigress, striking his great breast with her tiny hands. Tarzan could not understand it. A moment ago, and it had been his intention to hasten Jane back to her people, but that little moment was lost now in the dim and distant past of things which were, but can never be again, 
and with it the good intentions had gone to join the impossible. Since then Tarzan of the Apes had felt a warm, lithe form close-pressed to his. Hot, sweet breath against his cheek and mouth had fanned a new flame to life within his breast, and perfect lips had clung to his in burning kisses that had seared a deep brand into his soul, a brand which marked a new Tarzan. Again he laid his hand upon her arm. Again she repulsed him. And then Tarzan of the Apes did just what his first ancestor would have done. He took his woman in his arms and carried her into the jungle. Early the following morning, the four within the little cabin by the beach were awakened by the booming of a cannon. Clayton was the first to rush out, and there, beyond the harbor's mouth, he saw two vessels lying at anchor. One was the Arrow, and the other a small French cruiser. The sides of the latter were crowded with men gazing shoreward, and it was evident to Clayton, as to the others who had now joined him, that the gun which they had heard had been fired to attract their attention if they still remained at the cabin. Both vessels lay at a considerable distance from shore, and it was doubtful if their glasses would locate the waving hats of the little party far in between the harbor's points. Esmeralda had removed her red apron and was waving it frantically above her head. But Clayton, still fearing that even this might not be seen, hurried off toward the northern point, where lay his signal pyre ready for the match. It seemed an age to him, as to those who waited breathlessly behind, ere he reached the great pile of dry branches and underbrush. As he broke from the dense wood and came in sight of the vessels again, he was filled with consternation to see that the arrow was making sail, and that the cruiser was already under way. Quickly lighting the pyre in a dozen places, he hurried to the extreme point of the promontory, where he stripped off his shirt, and tying it to a fallen branch, stood waving it back and forth above him. But still the vessels continued to stand out, and he had given up all hope, when the great column of smoke rising above the forest in one dense vertical shaft, attracted the attention of a lookout aboard the cruiser, and instantly a dozen glasses were leveled on the beach. Presently Clayton saw the two ships come about again, and while the arrow lay drifting quietly on the ocean, the cruiser steamed slowly back toward shore. At some distance away she stopped and a boat was lowered and dispatched toward the beach. As it was drawn up, a young officer stepped out. "'Monsieur Clayton, I presume?' he asked. "'Thank God you have come,' was Clayton's reply. "'And it may be that it is not too late even now.' "'What do you mean, monsieur?' asked the officer. Clayton told of the abduction of Jane Porter, and the need of armed men to aid in the search for her. "'Mon Dieu!' exclaimed the officer sadly. "'Yesterday, and it would not have been too late.' Today, and it may be better that the poor lady were never found. It is horrible, monsieur. It is too horrible. Other boats had now put off from the cruiser, and Clayton, having pointed out the harbor's entrance to the officer, entered the boat with him, and its nose was turned toward the little landlocked bay, into which the other craft followed. Soon the entire party had landed where stood Professor Porter, Mr. Philander, and the weeping Esmeralda. Among the officers in the last boats to put off from the cruiser was the commander of the vessel, and when he had heard the story of Jane's abduction, he generously called for volunteers to accompany Professor Porter and Clayton in their search. Not an officer or a man was there of those brave and sympathetic Frenchmen who did not quickly beg leave to be one of the expedition. The commander selected twenty men and two officers, Lieutenant Darnot, and Lieutenant Charpentier. A boat was dispatched to the cruiser for provisions, ammunition, and carbines. The men were already armed with revolvers. Then, to Clayton's inquiries as to how they had happened to anchor offshore and fire a signal gun, the commander, Captain Dufran, explained that a month before they had sighted the arrow bearing southwest under considerable canvas, and that when they had signaled her to come about she had but crowded on more sail. They had kept her hull up until sunset, firing several shots after her, 
but the next morning she was nowhere to be seen. They had then continued to cruise up and down the coast for several weeks, and had about forgotten the incident of the recent chase, when, early one morning a few days before, the lookout had described a vessel laboring in the trough of a heavy sea, and evidently entirely out of control. As they steamed nearer to the derelict they were surprised to note that it was the same vessel that had run from them a few weeks earlier. Her forestaysail and mizzen spanker were set as though an effort had been made to hold her head up into the wind, but the sheets had parted, and the sails were tearing to ribbons in the half-gale of wind. In the high sea that it was running it was a difficult and dangerous task to attempt to put a prize crew aboard her, and as no signs of life had been seen above deck, it was decided to stand by until the wind and sea abated, but just then a figure was seen clinging to the rail and feebly waving a mute signal of despair toward them. Immediately a boat's crew was ordered out, and an attempt was successfully made to board the Arrow. The sight that met the Frenchmen's eyes as they clambered over the ship's side was appalling. A dozen dead and dying men rolled hither and thither upon the pitching deck, the living intermingled with the dead. Two of the corpses appeared to have been partially devoured as though by wolves. The prize crew soon had the vessel under proper sail once more, and the living members of the ill-starred company carried below to their hammocks. The dead were wrapped in tarpaulins and lashed on deck to be identified by their comrades before being consigned to the deep. None of the living was conscious when the Frenchman reached the arrow's deck. Even the poor devil who had waved the single despairing signal of distress had lapsed into unconsciousness before he had learned whether it had availed or not. It did not take the French officer long to learn what had caused the terrible condition aboard, for when water and brandy were sought to restore the men, it was found that there was none, nor even food of any description. He immediately signaled to the cruiser to send water, medicine, and provisions, and another boat made the perilous trip to the Arrow. When restoratives had been applied, several of the men regained consciousness, and then the whole story was told. That part of it we know up to the sailing of the Arrow after the murder of Snipes, and the burial of his body above the treasure chest. It seems that the pursuit by the cruiser had so terrorized the mutineers that they had continued out across the Atlantic for several days after losing her, but on discovering the meager supply of water and provisions aboard, they had turned back toward the east. With no one on board who understood navigation, discussions soon arose as to their whereabouts, and as three days sailing to the east did not raise land, they bore off to the north, fearing that the high north winds that had prevailed had driven them south of the southern extremity of Africa. They kept on a north-northeasterly course for two days, when they were overtaken by a calm which lasted for nearly a week. Their water was gone, and in another day they would be without food. Conditions changed rapidly from bad to worse. One man went mad and leaped overboard. Soon another opened his veins and drank his own blood. When he died they threw him overboard also though there were those among them who wanted to keep the corpse on board. Hunger was changing them from human beasts to wild beasts. Two days before they had been picked up by the cruiser, they had become too weak to handle the vessel, and that same day three men died. On the following morning it was seen that one of the corpses had been partially devoured. All that day the men lay glaring at each other like beasts of prey, in the following morning two of the corpses lay almost entirely stripped of flesh. The men were but little stronger for their ghoulish repast, for the want of water was by far the greatest agony with which they had to contend, and then the cruiser had come. When those who could had recovered, the entire story had been told to the French commander, but the men were too ignorant to be able to tell him at just what point on the coast the professor and his party had been marooned, so the cruiser had steamed slowly along within sight of land, firing occasional signal guns, and scanning every inch of the beach with glasses. They had anchored by night so as not to neglect a particle of the shoreline, 
and it had happened that the preceding night had brought them off the very beach where lay the little camp they sought. The signal guns of the afternoon before had not been heard by those on shore, it was presumed, because they had doubtless been in the thick of the jungle searching for Jane Porter for the noise of their own crashing through the underbrush would have drowned the report of a far distant gun. By the time the two parties had narrated their several adventures, the cruiser's boat had returned with supplies and arms for the expedition. Within a few minutes the little body of sailors and the two French officers, together with Professor Porter and Clayton, set off upon their hopeless and ill-fated quest into the untracked jungle. End of chapter. Chapter 20 of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 20 Heredity When Jane realized that she was being borne away a captive by the strange forest creature who had rescued her from the clutches of the ape, she struggled desperately to escape, but the strong arms that held her as easily as though she had been but a day-old babe only pressed a little more tightly. So presently she gave up the futile effort and lay quietly, looking through half-closed lids at the faces of the man who strode easily through the tangled undergrowth with her. The face above her was one of extraordinary beauty. A perfect type of the strongly masculine, unmarred by dissipation or brutal or degrading passions. For, though Tarzan of the Apes was a killer of men and of beasts, he killed as the hunter kills, dispassionately, except on those rare occasions when he had killed for hate, though not the brooding, malevolent hate which marks the features of its own with hideous lines. When Tarzan killed, he more often smiled than scowled, and smiles are the foundation of beauty. One thing the girl had noticed particularly when she had seen Tarzan rushing upon Turcos, the vivid scarlet band upon his forehead, from above the left eye to the scalp, but now as she scanned his features she noticed that it was gone and only a thin white line marked the spot where it had been. As she lay more quietly in his arms, Tarzan slightly relaxed his grip upon her. Once he looked down into her eyes and smiled, and the girl had to close her own to shut out the vision of that handsome, winning face. Presently Tarzan took to the trees, and Jane, wondering that she felt no fear, began to realize that in many respects she had never felt more secure in her whole life than now, as she lay in the arms of this strong, wild creature, being born, God alone knew where or to what fate, deeper and deeper into the savage fastness of the untamed forest. When, with closed eyes, she commenced to speculate upon the future, and terrifying fears were conjured by a vivid imagination, she had but to raise her lids and look upon that noble face so close to hers, to dissipate the last remnant of apprehension. No, he could never harm her. Of that she was convinced when she translated the fine features and the frank, brave eyes above her into the chivalry which they proclaimed. On and on they went through what seemed to Jane a solid mass of verdure. Yet ever there appeared to open before this forest god a passage, as by magic, which closed behind them as they passed scarce a branch scraped against her, yet above and below, before and behind, the view presented naught but a solid mass of inextricably interwoven branches and creepers. As Tarzan moved steadily onward, his mind was occupied with many strange and new thoughts. Here was a problem the like of which he had never encountered, and he felt rather than reasoned that he must meet it as a man and not as an ape. The free movement through the middle terrace, which was the route he had followed for the most part, had helped to cool the ardor of the first fierce passion of his new-found love. Now he discovered himself speculating upon the fate which would have fallen to the girl had he not rescued her from Turcos. 
He knew why the ape had not killed her, and he commenced to compare his intentions with those of Turco's. True, it was the order of the jungle for the male to take his mate by force, but could Tarzan be guided by the laws of the beasts? Was not Tarzan a man? What did men do? He was puzzled, for he did not know. He wished that he might ask the girl, and then it came to him that she had already answered him in the futile struggle she had made to escape and to repulse him. But now they had come to their destination, and Tarzan of the Apes, with Jane in his strong arms, swung lightly to the turf of the arena where the great apes held their councils and danced the wild orgy of the dum-dum. Though they had come many miles, it was still but mid-afternoon, and the amphitheatre was bathed in the half-light which filtered through the maze of encircling foliage. The green turf looked soft and cool and inviting. The myriad noises of the jungle seemed far distant and hushed to a mere echo of blurred sounds, rising and falling like the surf upon a remote shore. A feeling of dreamy peacefulness stole over Jane as she sank down upon the grass where Tarzan had placed her, and as she looked up at his great figure towering above her, there was added a strange sense of perfect security. As she watched him from beneath half-closed lids, Tarzan crossed the little circular clearing toward the trees upon the farther side. She noted the graceful majesty of his carriage the perfect symmetry of his magnificent figure, and the poise of his well-shaped head upon his broad shoulders. What a perfect creature! There could be naught of cruelty or baseness beneath that godlike exterior. Never, she thought, had such a man strode the earth since God created the first in his own image. With a bound Tarzan sprang into the trees and disappeared. Jane wondered where he had gone. Had he left her there to her fate in the lonely jungle? She glanced nervously about. Every vine and bush seemed but the lurking place of some huge and horrible beast waiting to bury gleaming fangs into her soft flesh. Every sound she magnified into the stealthy creeping of a sinuous and malignant body. How different now that he had left her! For a few minutes that seemed hours to the frightened girl. She sat with tense nerves, waiting for the spring of the crouching thing that was to end her misery of apprehension. She almost prayed for the cruel teeth that would give her unconsciousness and surcease from the agony of fear. She heard a sudden, slight sound behind her. With a cry she sprang to her feet and turned to face her end. There stood Tarzan, his arms filled with ripe and luscious fruit. Jane reeled and would have fallen, had not Tarzan, dropping his burden, caught her in his arms. She did not lose consciousness, but she clung tightly to him, shuddering and trembling like a frightened deer. Tarzan of the apes stroked her soft hair and tried to comfort and quiet her, as Kayla had him when, as a little ape, he had been frightened by Sabor the lioness, or Hista the snake. Once he pressed his lips lightly upon her forehead, and she did not move, but closed her eyes and sighed. She could not analyze her feelings, nor did she wish to attempt it. She was satisfied to feel the safety of those strong arms, and to leave her future to fate, for the last few hours had taught her to trust this strange wild creature of the forest, as she would have trusted but few of the men of her acquaintance. As she thought of the strangeness of it, there commenced to dawn upon her the realization that she had, possibly, learned something else which she had never really known before. Love. She wondered, and then she smiled. And still smiling she pushed Tarzan gently away, and looking at him with a half-smiling, half-quizzical expression that made her face wholly entrancing, she pointed to the fruit upon the ground and seated herself upon the edge of the earthen drum of the anthropoids, for hunger was asserting itself. Tarzan quickly gathered up the fruit, and bringing it, laid it at her feet, and then he too sat upon the drum beside her, and with his knife opened and prepared the various fruits for her meal. Together and in silence they ate, occasionally stealing sly glances at one another, until finally Jane broke into a merry laugh in which Tarzan joined. 
"'I wish you spoke English,' said the girl. Tarzan shook his head, and an expression of wistful and pathetic longing sobered his laughing eyes. Then Jane tried speaking to him in French, and then in German, but she had to laugh at her own blundering attempt at the latter tongue. "'Anyway,' she said to him in English, "'you understand my German as well as they did in Berlin.' <laughs> Tarzan had long since reached a decision as to what his future procedure should be. He had had time to recollect all that he had read of the ways of men and women in the books at the cabin. He would act as he imagined the men in the books would have acted were they in his place. Again he rose and went into the trees, but first he tried to explain by means of signs that he would return shortly, and he did so well that Jane understood and was not afraid when he had gone. Only a feeling of loneliness came over her, and she watched the point where he had disappeared, with longing eyes, awaiting his return. As before, she was appraised of his presence by a soft sound behind her, and turned to see him coming across the turf with a great armful of branches. Then he went back again into the jungle, and in a few minutes reappeared with a quantity of soft grasses and ferns. Two more trips he made until he had quite a pile of material at hand. Then he spread the ferns and grasses upon the ground in a soft, flat bed, and above it leaned many branches together so that they met a few feet over its center. Upon these he spread layers of huge leaves of the great elephant's ear, and with more branches and more leaves he closed one end of the little shelter he had built. Then they sat down together again upon the edge of the drum and tried to talk by signs. The magnificent diamond locket which hung about Tarzan's neck had been a source of much wonderment to Jane. She pointed to it now, and Tarzan removed it and handed the pretty bauble to her. She saw that it was the work of a skilled artisan, and that the diamonds were of great brilliancy and superbly set, but the cutting of them denoted that they were of a former day. She noticed, too, that the locket opened, and, pressing the hidden clasp, she saw the two halves spring apart to reveal in either section an ivory miniature. One was of a beautiful woman, and the other might have been a likeness of the man who sat beside her, except for a subtle difference of expression that was scarcely definable. She looked up at Tarzan to find him leaning toward her, gazing on the miniatures, with an expression of astonishment. He reached out his hand for the locket, and took it away from her examining the likenesses within it with unmistakable signs of surprise and new interest. His manner clearly denoted that he had never before seen them, nor imagined that the locket opened. This fact caused Jane to indulge in further speculation, and it taxed her imagination to picture how this beautiful ornament came into the possession of a wild and savage creature of the unexplored jungles of Africa. Still more wonderful was how it contained the likeness of one who might be a brother, or, more likely, the father of this woodland demigod who was even ignorant of the fact that the locket opened. Tarzan was still gazing with fixity at the two faces. Presently he removed the quiver from his shoulder, and emptying the arrows upon the ground, reached into the bottom of the bag-like receptacle, and drew forth a flat object, wrapped in many soft leaves, and tied with bits of long grass. Carefully he unwrapped it, removing layer after layer of leaves until at length he held a photograph in his hand. Pointing to the miniature of the man within the locket, he handed the photograph to Jane, holding the open locket beside it. The photograph only served to puzzle the girl still more, for it was evidently another likeness of the same man whose picture rested in the locket beside that of the beautiful young woman. Tarzan was looking at her with an expression of puzzled bewilderment in his eyes as she glanced up at him. He seemed to be framing a question with his lips. The girl pointed to the photograph, and then to the miniature, and then to him, as though to indicate that she thought the likenesses were of him. But he only shook his head, and then, shrugging his great shoulders, he took the photograph from her, and having carefully rewrapped it, placed it again in the bottom of his quiver. For a few moments he sat in silence, his eyes bent upon the ground, 
while Jane held the little locket in her hand, turning it over and over in an endeavor to find some further clue that might lead to the identity of its original owner. At length a simple explanation occurred to her. The locket had belonged to Lord Greystoke, and the likenesses were of himself and Lady Alice. This wild creature had simply found it in the cabin by the beach. How stupid of her not to have thought of that solution before! But to account for the strange likeness between Lord Greystoke and this forest god, that was quite beyond her, and it is not strange that she could not imagine that this naked savage was indeed an English nobleman. At length Tarzan looked up to watch the girl as she examined the locket. He could not fathom the meaning of the faces within, but he could read the interest and fascination upon the face of the live young creature by his side. She noticed that he was watching her, and thinking that he wished his ornament again, she held it out to him. He took it from her, and, taking the chain in his two hands, he placed it about her neck, smiling at her expression of surprise at this unexpected gift. Jane shook her head vehemently, and would have removed the golden links from about her throat, but Tarzan would not let her. Taking her hands in his, when she insisted upon it, he held them tightly to prevent her. At last she desisted, and with a little laugh raised the locket to her lips. Tarzan did not know precisely what she meant, but he guessed correctly that it was her way of acknowledging the gift, and so he rose, and taking the locket in his hand, stooped gravely like some courtier of old, and pressed his lips upon it where hers had rested. It was a stately and gallant little compliment, performed with a grace and dignity of utter unconsciousness of self. It was the hallmark of his aristocratic birth, the natural outcropping of many generations of fine breeding, an hereditary instinct of graciousness which a lifetime of uncouth and savage training and environment could not eradicate. It was growing dark now, and so they ate again of the fruit which was both food and drink for them. Then Tarzan rose, and leading Jane to the little bower he had erected, motioned her to go within. For the first time in hours a feeling of fear swept over her, and Tarzan felt her draw away as though shrinking from him. Contact with this girl for half a day had left a very different Tarzan from the one on whom the morning sun had risen. Now in every fibre of his being heredity spoke louder than training. He had not in one swift transition become a polished gentleman from a savage ape-man, but at last the instincts of the former predominated, and over all was the desire to please the woman he loved, and to appear well in her eyes. So Tarzan of the Apes did the only thing he knew to assure Jane of her safety. He removed his hunting-knife from its sheath, and handed it to her hilt first, again motioning her into the bower. The girl understood, and taking the long knife she entered, and lay down upon the soft grasses, while Tarzan of the apes stretched himself upon the ground across the entrance. And thus the rising sun found them in the morning. When Jane awoke, she did not at first recall the strange events of the preceding day, and so she wondered at her odd surroundings, the little leafy bower, the soft grasses of her bed, the unfamiliar prospect from the opening at her feet. Slowly the circumstances of her position crept one by one into her mind, and then a great wonderment arose in her heart, a mighty wave of thankfulness and gratitude that though she had been in such terrible danger, yet she was unharmed. She moved to the entrance of the shelter to look for Tarzan. He was gone, but this time no fear assailed her, for she knew that he would return. In the grass at the entrance to her bower she saw the imprint of his body, where he had lain all night to guard her. She knew that the fact that he had been there was all that had permitted her to sleep in such peaceful security. With him near, who could entertain fear? She wondered if there was another man on earth with whom a girl could feel so safe in the heart of this savage African jungle. Even the lions and panthers had no fears for her now. She looked up to see his lithe form drop softly from a nearby tree. As he caught her eyes upon him, 
his face lighted with that frank and radiant smile that had won her confidence the day before. As he approached her, Jane's heart beat faster, and her eyes brightened as they had never done before at the approach of any man. He had again been gathering fruit, and this he laid at the entrance of her bower. Once more they sat down together to eat. Jane commenced to wonder what his plans were. Would he take her back to the beach, or would he keep her here? Suddenly she realized that the matter did not seem to give her much concern. Could it be that she did not care? She began to comprehend, also, that she was entirely contented, sitting here by the side of this smiling giant, eating delicious fruit in a sylvan paradise, far within the remote depths of an African jungle, that she was contented and very happy. She could not understand it. Her reason told her that she should be torn by wild anxieties, weighted by dread fears cast down by gloomy forebodings, but instead her heart was singing, and she was smiling into the answering face of the man beside her. When they had finished their breakfast, Tarzan went to her bower and recovered his knife. The girl had entirely forgotten it. She realized that it was because she had forgotten the fear that prompted her to accept it. Motioning her to follow, Tarzan walked towards the trees at the edge of the arena and taking her in one strong arm swung to the branches above. The girl knew that he was taking her back to her people, and she could not understand the sudden feeling of loneliness and sorrow which crept over her. For hours they swung slowly along. Tarzan of the Apes did not hurry. He tried to draw out the sweet pleasure of that journey with those dear arms about his neck as long as possible, and so he went far south of the direct route to the beach. Several times they halted for brief rests, which Tarzan did not need, and at noon they stopped for an hour at a little brook, where they quenched their thirst, and ate. So it was nearly sunset when they came to the clearing, and Tarzan, dropping to the ground beside a great tree, parted the tall jungle grass and pointed out the little cabin to her. She took him by the hand to lead him to it, that she might tell her father that this man had saved her from death, and worse than death that he had watched over her as carefully as a mother might have done. But again, the timidity of the wild thing in the face of human habitation swept over Tarzan of the Apes. He drew back, shaking his head. The girl came closer to him, looking up with pleading eyes. Somehow she could not bear the thought of his going back into the terrible jungle alone. Still he shook his head, and finally he drew her to him very gently, and stooped to kiss her. But first he looked into her eyes, and waited to learn if she was pleased, or if she would repulse him. Just an instant the girl hesitated, and then she realized the truth, and throwing her arms about his neck, she drew his face to hers and kissed him, unashamed. "'I love you, I love you,' she murmured. From far in the distance came the faint sound of many guns. Tarzan and Jane raised their heads. From the cabin came Mr. Philander and Esmeralda. From where Tarzan and the girl stood they could not see the two vessels lying at anchor in the harbor. Tarzan pointed towards the sounds, touched his breast, and pointed again. She understood. He was going, and something told her that it was because he thought her people were in danger. Again he kissed her. "'Come back to me,' she whispered. "'I shall wait for you.' always. He was gone, and Jane turned to walk across the clearing to the cabin. Mr. Philander was the first to see her. It was dusk, and Mr. Philander was very nearsighted. "'Quickly, Mesmeralda!' he cried. "'Let us seek safety within. It is a lioness. Bless me!' Esmeralda did not bother to verify Mr. Philander's vision. His tone was enough. She was within the cabin and had slammed and bolted the door before he had finished pronouncing her name. The bless me was startled out of Mr. Philander by the discovery that Esmeralda, in the exuberance of her haste, had fastened him upon the same side of the door as was the close approaching lioness. He beat furiously upon the heavy portal. Esmeralda! Esmeralda! he shrieked. Let me in! I am being devoured by a lion! 
Esmeralda thought that the noise upon the door was made by the lioness in her attempts to pursue her, so, after her custom, she fainted. Mr. Philander cast a frightened glance behind him. Horrors! The thing was quite close now. He tried to scramble up the side of the cabin, and succeeded in catching a fleeting hold upon the thatched roof. For a moment he hung there, clawing with his feet like a cat on a clothesline. But presently a piece of the thatch came away, and Mr. Philander, preceding it, was precipitated upon his back. At the instant he fell a remarkable item of natural history leaped to his mind. If one feigns death, lions and lionesses are supposed to ignore one, according to Mr. Philander's faulty memory. So Mr. Philander lay as he had fallen, frozen into the horrid semblance of death. As his arms and legs had been extended stiffly upward as he came to earth upon his back, the attitude of death was anything but impressive. Jane had been watching his antics in mild-eyed surprise. Now she laughed, a little choking gurgle of a laugh, but it was enough. Mr. Philander rolled over upon his side and peered about. At length he discovered her. "'Jane!' he cried. "'Jane Porter! Bless me!' He scrambled to his feet and rushed toward her. He could not believe that it was she, and alive. "'Bless me! Where did you come from? Where in the world have you been? How—' "'Mercy, Mr. Philander,' interrupted the girl. "'I can never remember so many questions.' "'Well, well,' said Mr. Philander. "'Bless me! I am so filled with surprise and exuberant delight at seeing you safe and well again. I scarcely know what I am saying, really. But come, tell me all that has happened to you. End of chapter Chapter 21 of Tarzan of the Apes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith, of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes, by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 21. The Village of Torture. As the little expedition of sailors toiled through the dense jungle, searching for signs of Jane Porter, the futility of their venture became more and more apparent, but the grief of the old man and the hopeless eyes of the young Englishman prevented the kind-hearted Darnot from turning back. He thought that there might be a bare possibility of finding her body, or the remains of it, for he was positive that she had been devoured by some beast of prey. He deployed his men into a skirmish line from the point where Esmeralda had been found, and in this extended formation they pushed their way sweating and panting, through the tangled vines and creepers. It was slow work. Noon found them but a few miles inland. They halted for a brief rest then, and after pushing on for a short distance further, one of the men discovered a well-marked trail. It was an old elephant track, and Darnot, after consulting with Professor Porter and Clayton, decided to follow it. The path wound through the jungle in a northeasterly direction, and along it the column moved in single file. Lieutenant Darnot was in the lead, and moving at a quick pace, for the trail was comparatively open. Immediately behind him came Professor Porter, but as he could not keep pace with the younger man, Darnot was a hundred yards in advance, when suddenly a half-dozen black warriors arose about him. Darnot gave a warning shout to his column as the blacks closed on him, but before he could draw his revolver he had been pinioned and dragged into the jungle. His cry had alarmed the sailors, and a dozen of them sprang forward past Professor Porter, running up the trail to their officer's aid. They did not know the cause of his outcry, only that it was a warning of danger ahead. They had rushed past the spot where Darnot had been seized when a spear hurled from the jungle transfixed one of the men and then a volley of arrows fell among them. Raising their rifles, they fired into the underbrush in the direction from which the missiles had come. By this time the balance of the party had come up, and volley after volley was fired toward the concealed foe. It was these shots that Tarzan and Jane Porter had heard. 
Lieutenant Charpentier, who had been bringing up the rear of the column, now came running to the scene, and on hearing the details of the ambush, ordered the men to follow him, and plunged into the tangled vegetation. In an instant they were in a hand-to-hand -hand fight with some fifty black warriors of Mabonga's village. Arrows and bullets flew thick and fast. Queer African knives and French gun butts mingled for a moment in savage and bloody duels, but soon the natives fled into the jungle, leaving the Frenchmen to count their losses. Four of the twenty were dead, a dozen others were wounded, and Lieutenant Darnot was missing. Night was falling rapidly, and their predicament was rendered doubly worse when they could not even find the elephant trail which they had been following. There was but one thing to do, make camp where they were until daylight. Lieutenant Charpentier ordered a clearing made and a circular abattis of underbrush constructed about the camp. This work was not completed until long after dark, the men building a huge fire in the center of the clearing to give them light to work by. When all was safe as possible against attack of wild beasts and savage men, Lieutenant Charpentier placed sentries about the little camp, and the tired and hungry men threw themselves upon the ground to sleep. The groans of the wounded mingled with the roaring and growling of the great beasts which the noise and firelight had attracted, kept sleep, except in its most fitful form, from the tired eyes. It was a sad and hungry party that lay through the long night, praying for dawn. The blacks who had seized Darnot had not waited to participate in the fight which followed, but instead had dragged their prisoner a little way through the jungle, and then struck the trail further on beyond the scene of the fighting in which their fellows were engaged. They hurried him along, the sounds of battle growing fainter and fainter as they drew away from the contestants, until there suddenly broke upon Darnot's vision a good-sized clearing at the end of which stood a thatched and palisaded village. It was now dusk, but the watchers at the gate saw the approaching trio and distinguished one as a prisoner ere they reached the portals. A cry went up within the palisade. A great throng of women and children rushed out to meet the party, and then began for the French officer the most terrifying experience which man can encounter upon earth, the reception of a white prisoner into a village of African cannibals. To add to the fiendishness of their cruel savagery was the poignant memory of still crueler barbarities practiced upon them and theirs by the white officers of that arch-hypocrite Leopold II of Belgium, because of whose atrocities they had fled the Congo Free State, a pitiful remnant of what once had been a mighty tribe. They fell upon Darnot tooth and nail, beating him with sticks and stones and tearing at him with claw-like hands. Every vestige of clothing was torn from him, and the merciless blows fell upon his bare and quivering flesh. But not once did the Frenchman cry out in pain. He breathed a silent prayer that he be quickly delivered from his torture. But the death he prayed for was not to be so easily had. Soon the warriors beat the women away from their prisoner. He was to be saved for nobler sport than this, and the first wave of their passion having subsided, they contented themselves with crying out taunts and insults, and spitting upon him. Presently they reached the center of the village. There Darnot was bound securely to the great post from which no live man had ever been released. A number of the women scattered to their several huts to fetch pots and water, while others built a row of fires on which portions of the feast were to be broiled, while the balance would be slowly dried in strips for future use as they expected the other warriors to return with many prisoners. The festivities were delayed awaiting the return of the warriors who had remained to engage in the skirmish with the white men, so that it was quite late when all were in the village, and the dance of death commenced to circle around the doomed officer. Half fainting from pain and exhaustion, Darnot watched from beneath half-closed lids what seemed but the vagary of delirium, or some horrid nightmare from which he must soon awake. The bestial faces, daubed with color, the huge mouths and flabby hanging lips, the yellow teeth sharp-filed, the rolling demon eyes, the shining naked bodies, the cruel spears. Surely no such creatures really existed upon earth. He must indeed be dreaming. 
The savage whirling bodies circled nearer. Now a spear sprang forth and touched his arm. The sharp pain and the feel of hot trickling blood assured him of the awful reality of his hopeless position. Another spear, and then another touched him. He closed his eyes and held his teeth firm set. He would not cry out. He was a soldier of France, and he would teach these beasts how an officer and a gentleman died. Tarzan of the Apes needed no interpreter to translate the story of those distant shots. With Jane Porter's kisses still warm upon his lips, he was swinging with incredible rapidity through the forest trees straight toward the village of Mabonga. He was not interested in the location of the encounter, for he judged that that would soon be over. Those who were killed he could not aid, those who escaped would not need his assistance. It was to those who had neither been killed or escaped that he hastened, and he knew that he would find them by the great post in the center of Mabonga village. Many times had Tarzan seen Mabonga's black raiding parties return from the northward with prisoners, and always were the same scenes enacted about that grim stake, beneath the flaring light of many fires. He knew, too, that they seldom lost much time before consummating the fiendish purpose of their captures. He doubted that he would arrive in time to do more than avenge. On he sped. Night had fallen, and he traveled high along the upper terrace where the gorgeous tropic moon lighted the dizzy pathway through the gently undulating branches of the treetops. Presently he caught the reflection of a distant blaze. It lay to the right of his path. It must be the light from the campfire the two men had built before they were attacked. Tarzan knew nothing of the presence of the sailors. So sure was Tarzan of his jungle knowledge that he did not turn from his course, but passed the glare at a distance of a half mile. It was the campfire of the Frenchman. In a few minutes more Tarzan swung into the trees above Mbonga's village. Ah, he was not quite too late. Or was he? He could not tell. The figure at the stake was very still, yet the black warriors were but pricking it. Tarzan knew their customs. The death blow had not been struck. He could tell almost to a minute how far the dance had gone. In another instant Mbonga's knife would sever one of the victim's ears. That would mark the beginning of the end, for very shortly after only a writhing mass of mutilated flesh would remain. There would still be life in it, but death then would be the only charity it craved. The stake stood forty feet from the nearest tree. Tarzan coiled his rope. Then there rose suddenly above the fiendish cries of the dancing demons the awful challenge of the ape-man. The dancers halted as though turned to stone. The rope sped with singing whirr high above the heads of the blacks. It was quite invisible in the flaring lights of the campfires. Darnot opened his eyes. A huge black, standing directly before him, lunged backward as though felled by an invisible hand. Struggling and shrieking, his body, rolling from side to side, moved quickly toward the shadows beneath the leaves. The blacks, their eyes protruding in horror, watched spellbound. Once beneath the trees, the body rose straight into the air, and as it disappeared into the foliage above, the terrified negroes, screaming with fright, broke into a mad race for the village gate. Darnot was left alone. He was a brave man but he had felt the short hair's bristle upon the nape of his neck when that uncanny cry rose upon the air. As the writhing body of the black soared, as though by unearthly power, into the dense foliage of the forest, Darnot felt an icy shiver run along his spine, as though death had risen from a dark grave and laid a cold and clammy finger on his flesh. As Darnot watched the spot where the body had entered the tree, he heard the sounds of movement there. The branches swayed as though under the weight of a man's body. There was a crash, and the black came sprawling to earth again, to lie very quietly where he had fallen. Immediately after him came a white body, but this one alighted erect. Darnot saw a clean-limbed young giant emerge from the shadows into the firelight and come quickly toward him. What could it mean? Who could it be? Some new creature of torture and destruction, doubtless. Darnot waited. His eyes never left the face of the advancing man. 
nor did the other's frank, clear eyes waver beneath Darnot's fixed gaze. Darnot was reassured, but still without much hope, though he felt that that face could not mask a cruel heart. Without a word Tarzan of the Apes cut the bonds which held the Frenchman. Weak from suffering and loss of blood, he would have fallen but for the strong arm that caught him. He felt himself lifted from the ground. There was a sensation as of flying, and then he lost consciousness. End of chapter Chapter 22 of Tarzan of the Apes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 22 The Search Party When dawn broke upon the little camp of Frenchmen in the heart of the jungle, it found a sad and disheartened group. As soon as it was light enough to see their surroundings, Lieutenant Charpentier sent men in groups of three in several directions to locate the trail, and in ten minutes it was found, and the expedition was hurrying back toward the beach. It was slow work, for they bore the bodies of six dead men, two more having succumbed during the night, and several of those who were wounded required support to move even very slowly. Charpentier had decided to return to camp for reinforcements, and then make an attempt to track down the natives and rescue Darnot. It was late in the afternoon when the exhausted men reached the clearing by the beach, but for two of them the return brought so great a happiness that all their suffering and heartbreaking grief was forgotten on the instant. As the little party emerged from the jungle, the first person that Professor Porter and Cecil Clayton saw was Jane standing by the cabin door. With a little cry of joy and relief she ran forward to greet them, throwing her arms about her father's neck and bursting into tears for the first time since they had been cast upon this hideous and adventurous shore. Professor Porter strove manfully to suppress his own emotions, but the strain upon his nerves and weakened vitality were too much for him, and at length, burying his old face in the girl's shoulder, he sobbed quietly like a tired child. Jane led him toward the cabin, and the Frenchmen turned toward the beach from which several of their fellows were advancing to meet them. Clayton, wishing to leave father and daughter alone, joined the sailors and remained talking with the officers until their boat pulled away toward the cruiser, whither Lieutenant Charpentier was bound to report the unhappy outcome of his adventure. Then Clayton turned back slowly toward the cabin. His heart was filled with happiness. The woman he loved was safe. He wondered by what manner of miracle she had been spared. To see her alive seemed almost unbelievable. As he approached the cabin he saw Jane coming out. When she saw him she hurried forward to meet him. "'Jane,' he cried, "'God has been good to us indeed. Tell me how you escaped.' What form Providence took to save you for us? He had never before called her by her given name. Forty-eight hours before it would have suffused Jane with a soft glow of pleasure to have heard that name from Clayton's lips. Now it frightened her. Mr. Clayton, she said quietly, extending her hand, first let me thank you for your chivalrous loyalty to my dear father. He has told me how noble and self-sacrificing you have been. How can we repay you?" Clayton noticed that she did not return his familiar salutation, but he felt no misgivings on that score. She had been through so much. This was no time to force his love upon her, he quickly realized. "'I am already repaid,' he said. "'Just to see you and Professor Porter both safe, well, and together again. I do not think that I could much longer have endured the pathos of his quiet and uncomplaining grief. It was the saddest experience of my life, Miss Porter, and then, added to it, there was my own grief, the greatest I have ever known. But his was so hopeless, his was pitiful. 
It taught me that no love, not even that of a man for his wife, may be so deep and terrible and self-sacrificing as the love of a father for his daughter. The girl bowed her head. There was a question she wanted to ask, but it seemed almost sacrilegious in the face of the love of these two men, and the terrible suffering they had endured while she sat laughing and happy beside a godlike creature of the forest, eating delicious fruits and looking with eyes of love into answering eyes. But love is a strange master, and human nature is still stranger, so she asked her question. Where is the forest man who went to rescue you? Why did he not return? I do not understand, said Clayton. Whom do you mean? He who has saved each of us, who saved me from the gorilla. Oh, cried Clayton in surprise. It was he who rescued you. You have not told me anything of your adventure, you know. But the woodman, she urged, have you not seen him? When we heard the shots in the jungle, very faint and far away, he left me. We had just reached the clearing, and he hurried off in the direction of the fighting. I know he went to aid you. Her tone was almost pleading, her manner tense with suppressed emotion. Clayton could not but notice it, and he wondered, vaguely, why she was so deeply moved, so anxious to know the whereabouts of this strange creature. Yet a feeling of apprehension of some impending sorrow haunted him, and in his breast, unknown to himself, was implanted the first germ of jealousy and suspicion of the ape-man, to whom he owed his life. "'We did not see him,' he replied quietly. "'He did not join us.' And then, after a moment of thoughtful pause, "'Possibly he joined his own tribe, the men who attacked us.' He did not know why he had said it, for he did not believe it. The girl looked at him wide-eyed for a moment. No! she exclaimed vehemently, much too vehemently, he thought. It could not be. They were savages. Clayton looked puzzled. He is a strange, half-savage creature of the jungle, Miss Porter. We know nothing of him. He neither speaks nor understands any European tongue and his ornaments and weapons are those of the West Coast savages. Clayton was speaking rapidly. There are no other human beings than savages within hundreds of miles, Miss Porter. He must belong to the tribes which attacked us, or to some other equally savage. He may even be a cannibal. Jane blanched. I will not believe it, she half whispered. It is not true. You shall see she said, addressing Clayton, that he will come back and that he will prove that you are wrong. You do not know him as I do. I tell you that he is a gentleman. Clayton was a generous and chivalrous man, but something in the girl's breathless defense of the forest man stirred him to unreasoning jealousy, so that for the instant he forgot all that they owed to this wild demigod, and he answered her with a half-sneer upon his lip. "'Possibly you are right, Miss Porter,' he said. "'But I do not think that any of us need worry about our carrion-eating acquaintance. "'The chances are that he is some half-demented castaway "'who will forget us more quickly, but no more surely, than we shall forget him. "'He is only a beast of the jungle, Miss Porter.' "'The girl did not answer, for she felt her heart shrivel within her. She knew that Clayton spoke merely what he thought, and for the first time she began to analyze the structure which supported her new-found love, and to subject its object to a critical examination. Slowly she turned and walked back to the cabin. She tried to imagine her wood-god by her side in the saloon of an ocean liner. She saw him eating with his hands tearing into his food like a beast of prey, and wiping his greasy fingers upon his thighs. She shuddered. She saw him as she introduced him to her friends, uncouth, illiterate, a boor, and the girl winced. She had reached her room now, and as she sat upon the edge of her bed of ferns and grasses, 
with one hand resting upon her rising and falling bosom, she felt the hard outlines of the man's locket. She drew it out, holding it in the palm of her hand for a moment with tear-blurred eyes bent upon it. Then she raised it to her lips, and crushing it there buried her face in the soft ferns, sobbing. Beast, she murmured, then God make me a beast, for man or beast, I am yours. She did not see Clayton again that day. Esmeralda brought her supper to her, and she sent word to her father that she was suffering from the reaction following her adventure. The next morning Clayton left early with the relief expedition in search of Lieutenant Darnot. There were two hundred armed men this time, with ten officers and two surgeons, and provisions for a week. They carried bedding in hammocks, the latter for transporting their sick and wounded. It was a determined and angry company a punitive expedition as well as one of relief. They reached the site of the skirmish of the previous expedition shortly after noon, for they were now traveling a known trail, and no time was lost in exploring. From there on the elephant track led straight to Mabonga's village. It was but two o'clock when the head of the column halted upon the edge of the clearing. Lieutenant Charpentier, who was in command, immediately sent a portion of his force through the jungle to the opposite side of the village. Another detachment was dispatched to a point before the village gate, while he remained with a balance upon the south side of the clearing. It was arranged that the party which was to take its position to the north, and which would be the last to gain its station, should commence the assault and that their opening volley should be the signal for a concerted rush from all sides in an attempt to carry the village by storm at the first charge. For half an hour the men with Lieutenant Charpentier crouched in the dense foliage of the jungle, waiting the signal. To them it seemed like hours. They could see natives in the fields and others moving in and out of the village gate. At length the signal came, a sharp rattle of musketry, and like one man, an answering volley tore from the jungle to the west and to the south. The natives in the field dropped their implements and broke madly for the palisade. The French bullets mowed them down, and the French sailors bounded over their prostrate bodies straight for the village gate. So sudden and unexpected the assault had been that the whites reached the gates before the frightened natives could bar them and in another minute the village street was filled with armed men fighting hand to hand in inextricable tangle. For a few moments the blacks held their ground within the entrance to the street, but the revolvers, rifles, and cutlasses of the Frenchmen crumpled the native spearmen and struck down the black archers with their bows half drawn. Soon the battle turned to a wild rout, and then to a grim massacre for well, the French sailors had seen bits of Darnot's uniform upon several of the black warriors who opposed them. They spared the children and those of the women whom they were not forced to kill in self-defense, but when at length they stopped, panting, blood-covered and sweating, it was because there lived to oppose them no single warrior of all the savage village of Mbonga. Carefully they ransacked every hut and corner of the village, but no sign of Darnot could they find. They questioned the prisoners by signs, and finally one of the sailors who had served in the French Congo found that he could make them understand the bastard tongue that passes for language between the whites and the more degraded tribes of the coast. But even then they could learn nothing definite regarding the fate of Darnot. Only excited gestures and expressions of fear could they obtain in response to their inquiries concerning their fellow and at last they became convinced that these were but evidences of the guilt of these demons who had slaughtered and eaten their comrade two nights before. At length all hope left them, and they prepared to camp for the night within the village. The prisoners were herded into three huts where they were heavily guarded. Sentries were posted at the barred gates, and finally the village was wrapped in the silence of slumber except for the wailing of the native women for their dead. The next morning they set out upon the return march. Their original intention had been to burn the village, but this idea was abandoned and the prisoners were left behind, weeping and moaning, but with roofs to cover them and a palisade for refuge from the beasts of the jungle. 
Slowly the expedition retraced its steps of the preceding day. Ten loaded hammocks retarded its pace. In eight of them lay the more seriously wounded, while two swung beneath the weight of the dead. Clayton and Lieutenant Charpentier brought up the rear of the column. The Englishman silent in respect for the other's grief, for Darnot and Charpentier had been inseparable friends since boyhood. Clayton could not but realize that the Frenchman felt his grief the more keenly, because Darnot's sacrifice had been so futile, since Jane had been rescued before Darnot had fallen into the hands of the savages, and again because the service in which he had lost his life had been outside his duty and for strangers and aliens. But when he spoke of it to Lieutenant Charpentier, the latter shook his head. "'No, monsieur,' he said. Darnot would have chosen to die thus. I only grieve that I could not have died for him, or at least with him. I wish that you could have known him better, monsieur. He was indeed an officer and a gentleman, a title conferred on many, but deserved by so few. He did not die futilely, for his death and the cause of a strange American girl will make us, his comrades, face our ends the more bravely however they may come to us. Clayton did not reply, but within him rose a new respect for Frenchmen which remained undimmed ever after. It was quite late when they reached the cabin by the beach. A single shot before they emerged from the jungle had announced to those in camp, as well as on the ship, that the expedition had been too late for it had been prearranged that when they came within a mile or two of camp one shot was to be fired to denote failure, or three for success, while two would have indicated that they found no sign of either Darnot or his black captors. So it was a solemn party that awaited their coming, and few words were spoken as the dead and wounded men were tenderly placed in boats and rowed silently toward the cruiser. Clayton, exhausted from his five days of laborious marching through the jungle, and from the effects of his two battles with the blacks, turned toward the cabin to seek a mouthful of food, and then the comparative ease of his bed of grasses after two nights in the jungle. By the cabin door stood Jane. "'The poor lieutenant?' she asked. "'Did you find no trace of him?' "'We were too late, Miss Porter,' he replied sadly. "'Tell me what had happened,' she asked. "'I cannot, Miss Porter. It is too horrible.' "'You do not mean that they had tortured him?' she whispered. "'We do not know what they did to him before they killed him,' he answered, his face drawn with fatigue and the sorrow he felt for poor Darnot, and he emphasized the word before. "'Before they killed him? What do you mean?' They are not. They are not. She was thinking of what Clayton had said of the forest man's probable relationship to this tribe, and she could not frame the awful word. Yes, Miss Porter, they were cannibals, he said almost bitterly, for to him, too, had suddenly come the thought of the forest man, and the strange unaccountable jealousy he had felt two days before swept over him once more and then in sudden brutality that was as unlike Clayton as courteous consideration is unlike an ape, he blurted out, When your forest god left you he was doubtless hurrying to the feast. He was sorry ere the words were spoken, though he did not know how cruelly they had cut the girl. His regret was for his baseless disloyalty to one who had saved the lives of every member of his party, and offered harm to none. The girl's head went high. "'There could be but one suitable reply to your assertion, Mr. Clayton,' she said icily, "'and I regret that I am not a man, that I might make it.' She turned quickly and entered the cabin. Clayton was an Englishman, so the girl had passed quite out of sight before he deduced what reply a man would have made. "'Upon my word,' he said ruefully, "'she called me a liar.' And I fancy I jolly well deserved it, he added thoughtfully. Clayton, my boy, I know you were tired out and unstrung, but that's no reason why you should make an ass of yourself. You'd better go to bed. 
but before he did so he called gently to Jane upon the opposite side of the sailcloth partition, for he wished to apologize, but he might as well have addressed the Sphinx. Then he wrote upon a piece of paper and shoved it beneath the partition. Jane saw the little note and ignored it, for she was very angry and hurt and mortified. But she was a woman, and so eventually she picked it up and read it. My dear Miss Porter, I had no reason to insinuate what I did. My only excuse is that my nerves must be unstrung, which is no excuse at all. Please try and think that I did not say it. I am very sorry. I would not have hurt you above all others in the world. Say that you forgive me. William Cecil Clayton He did think it, or he would never have said it, reasoned the girl. But it cannot be true. Oh, I know it is not true. One sentence in the letter frightened her. I would not have hurt you above all others in the world. A week ago that sentence would have filled her with delight. Now it depressed her. She wished she had never met Clayton. She was sorry that she had ever seen the forest god. No, she was glad. And there was that other note she had found in the grass before the cabin the day after her return from the jungle, the love note signed by Tarzan of the Apes. Who could be this new suitor? If he were another of the wild denizens of this terrible forest, what might he not do to claim her? Esmeralda, wake up! she cried. You make me so irritable, sleeping there peacefully when you know perfectly well that the world is filled with sorrow. Gabrielle! screamed Esmeralda, sitting up. What is it now? A hipponeroceros? Where is he, Miss Jane? Nonsense, Esmeralda, there is nothing. Go back to sleep. You are bad enough asleep, but you are infinitely worse awake. Yes, honey, but what's the matter with you, precious? You act sort of disgranulated this evening. Oh, Esmeralda, I'm just plain ugly tonight, said the girl. Don't pay any attention to me. That's a dear. Yes, honey, now you go right to sleep. Your nerves are all on edge. What with all these ripotamuses and man-eating geniuses that Mr. Philander been telling about? Lord, I ain't no wonder we all get nervous prosecution. Jane crossed the little room laughing and kissing the faithful woman, bid Esmeralda good night. End of chapter Chapter Twenty Three of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter Twenty Three Brother Men. When Darnot regained consciousness, he found himself lying upon a bed of soft ferns and grasses beneath a little A-shaped shelter of boughs. At his feet an opening looked out upon a green sward, and at a little distance beyond was the dense wall of jungle and forest. He was very lame and sore and weak, and as full consciousness returned he felt the sharp torture of many cruel wounds and the dull aching of every bone and muscle in his body as a result of the hideous beating he had received. Even the turning of his head caused him such excruciating agony that he lay still with closed eyes for a long time. He tried to piece out the details of his adventure prior to the time he lost consciousness to see if they would explain his present whereabouts. He wondered if he were among friends or foes. At length he recollected the whole hideous scene at the stake and finally recalled the strange white figure in whose arms he had sunk into oblivion. Darnot wondered what fate lay in store for him now. He could neither see nor hear any signs of life about him. The incessant hum of the jungle, the rustling of millions of leaves, the buzz of insects, the voices of the birds and monkeys, seemed blended into a strangely soothing purr, 
as though he lay apart, far from the myriad life whose sounds came to him only as a blurred echo. At length he fell into a quiet slumber, nor did he awake again until afternoon. Once more he experienced the strange sense of utter bewilderment that had marked his earlier awakening, but soon he recalled the recent past, and looking through the opening at his feet he saw the figure of a man squatting on his haunches. The broad, muscular back was turned toward him, but tanned though it was, Darnot saw that it was the back of a white man, and he thanked God. The Frenchman called faintly. The man turned, and rising, came toward the shelter. His face was very handsome, the handsomest, thought Darnot, that he had ever seen. Stooping, he crawled into the shelter beside the wounded officer, and placed a cool hand upon his forehead. Darnot spoke to him in French, but the man only shook his head. Sadly, it seemed to the Frenchman. Then Darnot tried English, but still the man shook his head. Italian, Spanish, and German brought similar discouragement. Darnot knew a few words of Norwegian, Russian, Greek, and also had a smattering of the language of one of the West Coast Negro tribes. The man denied them all. After examining Darnot's wounds, the man left the shelter and disappeared. In half an hour he was back with fruit and a hollow gourd-like vegetable filled with water. Darnot drank and ate a little. He was surprised that he had no fever. Again he tried to converse with his strange nurse, but the attempt was useless. Suddenly the man hastened from the shelter, only to return a few minutes later with several pieces of bark and wonder of wonders, a lead pencil. Squatting beside Darnot, he wrote for a minute on the smooth inner surface of the bark, then he handed it to the Frenchman. Darnot was astonished to see, in plain print-like characters, a message in English. I am Tarzan of the Apes. Who are you? Can you read this language? Darnot seized the pencil, then he stopped. This strange man wrote English. Evidently, he was an Englishman. Yes, said Darnot. I read English. I speak it also. Now we may talk. First let me thank you for all that you have done for me. The man only shook his head and pointed to the pencil and the bark. Mon Dieu! cried Darnot. If you are English, why is it that you cannot speak English? And then, in a flash, it came to him. The man was a mute, possibly a deaf mute. So Darnot wrote a message on the bark, in English. I am Paul Darnot, lieutenant in the Navy of France. I thank you for what you have done for me. You have saved my life, and all that I have is yours. May I ask how it is that one who writes English does not speak it? Tarzan's reply filled Darnot with still greater wonder. I speak only the language of my tribe, the great apes who were Kerchaks, and a little of the languages of Tantor, the elephant, and Numa, the lion, and of the other folks of the jungle I understand. With a human being I have never spoken, except once with Jane Porter, by signs. This is the first time I have spoken with another of my kind through written words. Darnot was mystified. It seemed incredible that there lived upon earth a full-grown man who had never spoken with a fellow man, and still more preposterous that such a one could read and write. He looked again at Tarzan's message, except once with Jane Porter. That was the American girl who had been carried into the jungle by a gorilla. A sudden light commenced to dawn on Darnot. This, then, was the gorilla. He seized the pencil and wrote, Where is Jane Porter? And Tarzan replied below, Back with her people in the cabin of Tarzan of the Apes. She is not dead, then? Where was she? What happened to her? She is not dead. She was taken by Turcos to be his wife. But Tarzan of the Apes took her away from Turcos and killed him before he could harm her. None in all the jungle may face Tarzan of the Apes in battle and live. I am Tarzan of the Apes, mighty fighter. Darnot wrote, 
I am glad she is safe. It pains me to write. I will rest a while. And then Tarzan. Yes, rest. When you are well, I shall take you back to your people. For many days Darnot lay upon his bed of soft ferns. The second day a fever had come, and Darnot thought that it meant infection, and he knew that he would die. An idea came to him. He wondered why he had not thought of it before. He called Tarzan and indicated by signs that he would write, and when Tarzan had fetched the bark and pencil, Darnot wrote, Can you go to my people and lead them here? I will write a message that you may take to them, and they will follow you. Tarzan shook his head, and taking the bark wrote, I had thought of that the first day, but I dared not. The great apes come often to this spot, and if they found you here, wounded and alone, they would kill you. Darnot turned on his side and closed his eyes. He did not wish to die, but he felt that he was going, for the fever was mounting higher and higher. That night he lost consciousness. For three days he was in delirium, and Tarzan sat beside him and bathed his head and hands and washed his wounds. On the fourth day the fever broke as suddenly as it had come, but it left Darnot a shadow of his former self, and very weak. Tarzan had to lift him that he might drink from the gourd. The fever had not been the result of infection, as Darnot had thought, but one of those that commonly attack whites in the jungles of Africa, and either kill or leave them as suddenly as Darnot's had left him. Two days later Darnot was tottering about the amphitheatre, Tarzan's strong arm about him to keep him from falling. They sat beneath the shade of a great tree, and Tarzan found some smooth bark that they might converse. Darnot wrote the first message. What can I do to repay you for all that you have done for me? And Tarzan, in reply, Teach me to speak the language of men. And so Darnot commenced at once, pointing out familiar objects and repeating their names in French, for he thought that it would be easier to teach this man his own language since he understood it himself best of all. It meant nothing to Tarzan, of course, for he could not tell one language from another, so when he pointed to the word man, which he had printed upon a piece of bark, he learned from Darnot that it was pronounced um, and in the same way he was taught to pronounce ape, songe, and tree, arbre. He was a most eager student, and in two more days had mastered so much French that he could speak little sentences such as, That is a tree, this is grass, I am hungry, and the like, but Darnot found that it was difficult to teach him the French construction upon a foundation of English. The Frenchman wrote little lessons for him in English, and had Tarzan repeat them in French, but as a literal translation was usually very poor French, Tarzan was often confused. Darnot realized now that he had made a mistake, but it seemed too late to go back and do it all over again, and force Tarzan to unlearn all that he had learned, especially as they were rapidly approaching a point where they would be able to converse. On the third day after the fever broke, Tarzan wrote a message asking Darnot if he felt strong enough to be carried back to the cabin. Tarzan was as anxious to go as Darnot, for he longed to see Jane again. It had been hard for him to remain with the Frenchman all these days for that very reason, and that he had unselfishly done so spoke more glowingly of his nobility of character than even did his rescuing the French officer from Mabonga's clutches. Darnot, only too willing to attempt the journey, wrote, "'But you cannot carry me all the distance through this tangled forest.' Tarzan laughed. "'Mais oui,' he said, and Darnot laughed aloud to hear the phrase that he used so often glide from Tarzan's tongue. So they set out, Darnot marveling as had Clayton and Jane at the wondrous strength and agility of the ape-man. Mid-afternoon brought them to the clearing, and as Tarzan dropped to earth from the branches of the last tree, his heart leaped and bounded against his ribs in anticipation of seeing Jane so soon again. No one was in sight outside the cabin, and Darnot was perplexed to note that neither the cruiser nor the arrow was at anchor in the bay. An atmosphere of loneliness pervaded the spot. 
which caught suddenly at both men as they strode toward the cabin. Neither spoke, yet both knew before they opened the closed door what they would find beyond. Tarzan lifted the latch and pushed the great door in upon its wooden hinges. It was as they had feared. The cabin was deserted. The men turned and looked at one another. Darnot knew that his people thought him dead, but Tarzan thought only of the woman who had kissed him in love and now had fled from him while he was serving one of her people. A great bitterness rose in his heart. He would go away, far into the jungle, and join his tribe. Never would he see one of his own kind again, nor could he bear the thought of returning to the cabin. He would leave that forever behind him, with the great hopes he had nursed there of finding his own race and becoming a man among men. And the Frenchman, Darnot, what of him? He could get along as Tarzan had. Tarzan did not want to see him more. He wanted to get away from everything that might remind him of Jane. As Tarzan stood upon the threshold brooding, Darnot had entered the cabin. Many comforts he saw that had been left behind. He recognized numerous articles from the cruiser, a camp oven, some kitchen utensils, a rifle and many rounds of ammunition, canned foods, blankets, two chairs and a cot, and several books and periodicals, mostly American. They must intend returning, thought Darnot. He walked over to the table that John Clayton had built so many years before to serve as a desk, and on it he saw two notes addressed to Tarzan of the Apes. One was in a strong masculine hand and was unsealed. The other, in a woman's hand, was sealed. "'Here are two messages for you, Tarzan of the Apes,' cried Darnot, turning toward the door. But his companion was not there. Darnot walked to the door and looked out. Tarzan was nowhere in sight. He called aloud, but there was no response. "'Mon Dieu!' exclaimed Darnot. "'He has left me. I feel it. He has gone back into his jungle and left me here alone.' And then he remembered the look on Tarzan's face when they had discovered that the cabin was empty, such a look as the hunter sees in the eyes of the wounded deer he has wantonly brought down. The man had been hard hit. Darnot realized it now. But why? He could not understand. The Frenchman looked about him. The loneliness and the horror of the place commenced to get on his nerves, already weakened by the ordeal of suffering and sickness he had passed through. To be left here alone beside this awful jungle, never to hear a human voice or see a human face, in constant dread of savage beasts and more terribly savage men, a prey to solitude and hopelessness. It was awful. And far to the east Tarzan of the Apes was speeding through the middle terrace back to his tribe, Never had he travelled with such reckless speed. He felt that he was running away from himself, that by hurtling through the forest like a frightened squirrel, he was escaping from his own thoughts. But no matter how fast he went, he found them always with him. He passed above the sinuous body of Sabor, the lioness, going in the opposite direction. Toward the cabin, thought Tarzan. What could Darnot do against Sabor? or if Bolgani the gorilla should come upon him, or Numa the lion, or cruel Sheeta. Tarzan paused in his flight. "'What are you, Tarzan?' he asked aloud. "'An ape or a man? "'If you are an ape, you will do as the apes would do. "'Leave one of your kind to die in the jungle "'if it suited your whim to go elsewhere. "'If you are a man, you will return to protect your kind.' You will not run away from one of your own people, because one of them has run away from you. Darnot closed the cabin door. He was very nervous. Even brave men, and Darnot was a brave man, are sometimes frightened by solitude. He loaded one of the rifles and placed it within easy reach. Then he went to the desk and took up the unsealed letter addressed to Tarzan. Possibly it contained word that his people had but left the beach temporarily. He felt that it would be no breach of ethics to read this letter, so he took the enclosure from the envelope and read, To Tarzan of the Apes, we thank you for the use of your cabin, 
and are sorry that you did not permit us the pleasure of seeing and thanking you in person. We have harmed nothing, but have left many things for you which may add to your comfort and safety here in your lonely home. If you know the strange white man who saved our lives so many times, and brought us food, and if you can converse with him, thank him also for his kindness. We sail within the hour, never to return, but we wish you and that other jungle friend to know that we shall always thank you for what you did for strangers on your shore, and that we should have done infinitely more to reward you both had you given us the opportunity. Very respectfully, William Cecil Clayton. Never to return, muttered Darnot, and threw himself face downward upon the cot. An hour later he started up listening. Something was at the door trying to enter. Darnot reached for the loaded rifle and placed it to his shoulder. Dusk was falling, and the interior of the cabin was very dark, but the man could see the latch moving from its place. He felt his hair rising upon his scalp. Gently the door opened, until a thin crack showed something standing just beyond. Darnot sighted along the blue barrel at the crack of the door, and then he pulled the trigger. End of chapter Chapter 24 of Tarzan of the Apes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 24 Lost Treasure when the expedition returned, following their fruitless endeavor to succor Darnot, Captain Dufran was anxious to steam away as quickly as possible, and all save Jane had acquiesced. No, she said determinedly, I shall not go, nor should you, for there are two friends in that jungle who will come out of it some day, expecting to find us awaiting them. Your officer, Captain Dufran, is one of them and the forest man who has saved the lives of every member of my father's party is the other. He left me at the edge of the jungle two days ago to hasten to the aid of my father and Mr. Clayton, as he thought, and he has stayed to rescue Lieutenant Darnot, of that you may be sure. Had he been too late to be of service to the lieutenant, he would have been back before now. The fact that he is not back is sufficient proof to me that he is delayed because Lieutenant Darnot is wounded or he has had to follow his captors further than the village which your sailors attacked. But poor Darnot's uniform and all his belongings were found in that village, Miss Porter, argued the captain. And the natives showed great excitement when questioned as to the white man's fate. Yes, captain, but they did not admit that he was dead, and as for his clothes and accoutrements being in their possession, why more civilized people than these poor savage negroes? strip their prisoners of every article of value, whether they intend killing them or not. Even the soldiers of my own dear South looted not only the living but the dead. It is strong circumstantial evidence, I will admit, but it is not positive proof. Possibly your forest man himself was captured or killed by the savages, suggested Captain Dufran. The girl laughed. You do not know him she replied, a little thrill of pride setting her nerves a tingle at the thought that she spoke of her own. "'I admit that he would be worth waiting for, this uh, superman of yours,' laughed the captain. "'I most certainly should like to see him.' "'Then wait for him, my dear captain,' urged the girl, "'for I intend doing so.' The Frenchman would have been a very much surprised man could he have interpreted the true meaning of the girl's words." They had been walking from the beach toward the cabin as they talked, and now they joined a little group sitting on camp stools in the shade of a great tree beside the cabin. Professor Porter was there, and Mr. Philander and Clayton, with Lieutenant Charpentier and two of his brother officers, while Esmeralda hovered in the background, 
ever and anon venturing opinions and comments with the freedom of an old and much indulged family servant. The officers arose and saluted as their superior approached, and Clayton surrendered his camp stool to Jane. We were just discussing poor Paul's fate, said Captain Dufran. Miss Porter insists that we have no absolute proof of his death, nor have we, and on the other hand she maintains that the continued absence of your omnipotent jungle friend indicates that Darnot is still in need of his services, either because he is wounded or still is a prisoner in a more distant native village. It has been suggested, ventured Lieutenant Charpentier, that the wild man may have been a member of the tribe of blacks who attacked our party, that he was hastening to aid them, his own people. Jane shot a quick glance at Clayton. It seems vastly more reasonable, said Professor Porter. I do not agree with you, objected Mr. Philander. He had ample opportunity to harm us himself, or to lead his people against us. Instead, during our long residence here, he has been uniformly consistent in his role of protector and provider. That is true, interjected Clayton. Yet we must not overlook the fact that except for himself, the only human beings within hundreds of miles are savage cannibals. He was armed precisely as are they, which indicates that he has maintained relations of some nature with them, and the fact that he is but one against possibly thousands suggests that these relations could scarcely have been other than friendly. It seems improbable, then, that he is not connected with them, remarked the captain, possibly a member of this tribe. Otherwise, added another of the officers, how could he have lived a sufficient length of time among the savage denizens of the jungle, brute and human, to have become proficient in woodcraft or in the use of African weapons? You are judging him according to your own standards, gentlemen, said Jane. An ordinary white man such as any of you, oh, pardon me, I did not mean just that. Rather, a white man above the ordinary in physique and intelligence could never, I grant you, have lived a year alone and naked in this tropical jungle. But this man not only surpasses the average white man in strength and agility, but as far transcends our trained athletes and strong men as they surpass a day-old babe, and his courage and ferocity in battle are those of the wild beast. "'He has certainly won a loyal champion, Miss Porter,' said Captain Dufrand, laughing. "'I am sure that there be none of us here but would willingly face death a hundred times in its most terrifying forms to deserve the tributes of one even half so loyal or so beautiful.' "'You would not wonder that I defend him,' said the girl. "'Could you have seen him as I saw him, battling in my behalf with that huge hairy brute? Could you have seen him charge the monster as a bull might charge a grizzly, absolutely without sign of fear or hesitation? You would have believed him more than human. Could you have seen those mighty muscles nodding under the brown skin? Could you have seen them force back those awful fangs? You, too, would have thought him invincible. And could you have seen the chivalrous treatment which he accorded a strange girl of a strange race? You would feel the same absolute confidence in him that I feel. "'You have won your suit, my fair pleader,' cried the captain. "'This court finds the defendant not guilty, and the cruiser shall wait a few days longer that he may have an opportunity to come and thank the divine Portia.' "'For the Lord's sake, honey,' cried Esmeralda, "'you all don't mean to tell me that you're going to stay right here in this here land of carnivorable animals, when you all got the opportunity to escapade on that boat? Don't you tell me that, honey!' "'Why, Esmeralda, you should be ashamed of yourself,' cried Jane. "'Is this any way to show your gratitude to the man who saved your life twice?' "'Well, Miss Jane, that's all just as you say, but that their forest man never did save us to stay here. He done save us so we could all get away from here. I expect he'd be mighty peevish when he find we ain't got no more sense than to stay right here after he'd done give us the chance to get away. I hoped I'd never have to sleep in this here geological garden 
another night and listen to all them lonesome noises that come out of that jumble after dark. I don't blame you a bit, Esmeralda, said Clayton, and you certainly did hit it off right when you called them lonesome noises. I never have been able to find the right word for them, but that's it, don't you know? Lonesome noises. You and Esmeralda had better go and live on the cruiser, said Jane in fine scorn. What would you think if you had to live all of your life in that jungle, as our forest man has done? I'm afraid I'd be a blooming bounder as a wild man, laughed Clayton ruefully. Those noises at night make the hair on my head bristle. I suppose that I should be ashamed to admit it, but it's the truth. I don't know about that, said Lieutenant Charpentier. I never thought much about fear and that sort of thing, never tried to determine whether I was a coward or brave man, but the other night, as we lay in the jungle there after poor Tarnot was taken, and those jungle noises rose and fell around us, I began to think that I was a coward indeed. It was not the roaring and growling of the big beast that affected me so much as it was the stealthy noises the ones that you heard suddenly close by, and then listen vainly for a repetition of, the unaccountable sounds as of a great body moving almost noiselessly, and the knowledge that you didn't know how close it was, or whether it was creeping closer after you ceased to hear it. It was those noises, and the eyes. Mon Dieu, I shall see them in the dark for ever. The eyes that you see and those that you don't see but feel, ah, they are the worst. All were silent for a moment, and then Jane spoke. And he is out there, she said in an awe-hushed whisper. Those eyes will be glaring at him tonight, and at your comrade Lieutenant Darnot. Can you leave them, gentlemen, without at least rendering them the passive succor which remaining here a few days longer might ensure them? "'Tut, tut, child,' said Professor Porter. "'Captain Dufran is willing to remain, and for my part I am perfectly willing, perfectly willing, as I have always been to humor your childish whims. "'We can utilize the morrow in recovering the chest, Professor,' suggested Mr. Philander. "'Quite so, quite so, Mr. Philander. I had almost forgotten the treasure,' exclaimed Professor Porter. "'Possibly we can borrow some men from Captain Dufran to assist us, and one of the prisoners to point out the location of the chest.' "'Most assuredly, my dear Professor, we are all yours to command,' said the captain. And so it was arranged that on the next day Lieutenant Charpentier was to take a detail of ten men, and one of the mutineers of the Arrow as a guide, and unearth the treasure, and that the cruiser would remain for a full week in the little harbour. At the end of that time it was to be assumed that Darnot was truly dead, and that the forest man would not return while they remained. Then the two vessels were to leave with all the party. Professor Porter did not accompany the treasure-seekers on the following day, but when he saw them returning empty-handed toward noon, he hastened forward to meet them. His usual preoccupied indifference entirely vanished, and in its place a nervous and excited manner. "'Where is the treasure?' he cried to Clayton, while yet a hundred feet separated them. Clayton shook his head. "'Gone,' he said, as he neared the professor. "'Gone! It cannot be! Who could have taken it?' cried Professor Porter. "'God only knows, Professor,' replied Clayton. We might have thought the fellow who guided us was lying about the location, but his surprise and consternation on finding no chest beneath the body of the murdered snipes were too real to be feigned, and then our spades showed us that something had been buried beneath the corpse, for a hole had been there, and it had been filled with loose earth. "'But who could have taken it?' repeated Professor Porter. "'Suspicion might naturally fall on the men of the cruiser,' said Lieutenant Charpentier, but for the fact that Sub-Lieutenant Jean Vier here assures me that no men had had shore leave, that none has been on shore since we anchored here except under command of an officer, 
I do not know that you would suspect our men, but I am glad that there is now no chance for suspicion to fall on them, he concluded. It would never have occurred to me to suspect the men to whom we owe so much, replied Professor Porter graciously. I would as soon suspect my dear Clayton here, or Mr. Philander. The Frenchman smiled, both officers and sailors. It was plain to see that a burden had been lifted from their minds. The treasure has been gone for some time, continued Clayton. In fact, the body fell apart as we lifted it, which indicates that whoever removed the treasure did so while the corpse was still fresh, for it was intact when we first uncovered it. There must have been several in the party, said Jane, who had joined them. You remember that it took four men to carry it. By Jove! cried Clayton. That's right. It must have been done by a party of blacks. Probably one of them saw the men bury the chest, and then returned immediately after with a party of his friends, and carried it off. Speculation is futile, said Professor Porter sadly. The chest is gone. We shall never see it again, nor the treasure that was in it. Only Jane knew what the loss meant to her father, and none there knew what it meant to her. Six days later Captain Dufran announced that they would sail early on the morrow. Jane would have begged for a further reprieve had it not been that she too had begun to believe that her forest lover would return no more. In spite of herself she began to entertain doubts and fears. The reasonableness of the arguments of these disinterested French officers commenced to convince her against her will. That he was a cannibal she would not believe, but that he was an adopted member of some savage tribe at length seemed possible to her. She would not admit that he could be dead. It was impossible to believe that that perfect body, so filled with triumphant life, could ever cease to harbor the vital spark, as soon believed that immortality were dust. As Jane permitted herself to harbor these thoughts, others equally unwelcome forced themselves upon her. If he belonged to some savage tribe, he had a savage wife, a dozen of them perhaps, and wild half-caste children. The girl shuddered, and when they told her that the cruiser would sail on the morrow, she was almost glad. It was she, though, who suggested that arms, ammunition, supplies, and comforts be left behind in the cabin, ostensibly for that intangible personality who had signed himself Tarzan of the Apes, and for Darnot, should he still be living, but really, she hoped, for her forest god, even though his feet should prove of clay. At the last minute she left a message for him, to be transmitted by Tarzan of the Apes. She was the last to leave the cabin, returning on some trivial pretext, after the others had started for the boat. She kneeled down beside the bed in which she had spent so many nights, and offered up a prayer for the safety of her primeval man, and crushing his locket to her lips, she murmured, I love you, and because I love you I believe in you, but if I did not believe, still should I love. Had you come back for me? and had there been no other way, I would have gone into the jungle with you forever. End of chapter Chapter 25 of Tarzan of the Apes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 25 The Outpost of the World With the report of his gun, Darnot saw the door fly open, and the figure of a man pitch headlong within onto the cabin floor. The Frenchman in his panic raised his gun to fire again into the prostrate form, but suddenly in the half-dusk of the open door he saw that the man was white, and in another instant realized that he had shot his friend and protector, Tarzan of the Apes. With a cry of anguish Darnot sprang to the ape-man's side, and kneeling, lifted the latter's head in his arms, calling Tarzan's name aloud. 
there was no response, and then D'Arnot placed his ear above the man's heart. To his joy he heard its steady beating beneath. Carefully he lifted Tarzan to the cot, and then, after closing and bolting the door, he lighted one of the lamps and examined the wound. The bullet had struck a glancing blow upon the skull. There was an ugly flesh wound, but no signs of a fracture of the skull. Darnot breathed a sigh of relief, and went about bathing the blood from Tarzan's face. Soon the cool water revived him, and presently he opened his eyes to look in questioning surprise at Darnot. The latter had bound the wound with pieces of cloth, and as he saw that Tarzan had regained consciousness, he arose and going to the table wrote a message, which he handed to the ape-man, explaining the terrible mistake he had made and how thankful he was that the wound was not more serious. Tarzan, after reading the message, sat on the edge of the couch and laughed. "'It is nothing,' he said in French, and then, his vocabulary failing him, he wrote, "'You should have seen what Volgani did to me, and Kerchak, and Turkoz, before I killed them. Then you would laugh at such a little scratch.' Darnot handed Tarzan the two messages that had been left for him. Tarzan read the first one through with a look of sorrow on his face. The second one he turned over and over, searching for an opening. He had never seen a sealed envelope before. At length he handed it to Darnot. The Frenchman had been watching him, and knew that Tarzan was puzzled over the envelope. How strange it seemed that to a full-grown white man an envelope was a mystery. Darnot opened it and handed the letter back to Tarzan. Sitting on a camp stool, the ape man spread the written sheet before him and read, To Tarzan of the Apes, Before I leave, let me add my thanks to those of Mr. Clayton for the kindness you have shown in permitting us the use of your cabin. That you never came to make friends with us has been a great regret to us. We should have liked so much to have seen and thanked our host. There is another I should like to thank also, but he did not come back, though I cannot believe that he is dead. I do not know his name. He is the great white giant who wore the diamond locket upon his breast. If you know him and can speak his language, carry my thanks to him, and tell him that I waited seven days for him to return. Tell him also that in my home in America, in the city of Baltimore, there will always be a welcome for him if he cares to come. I found a note you wrote me lying among the leaves beneath the tree near the cabin. I do not know how you learned to love me, who have never spoken to me, and I am very sorry if it is true, for I have already given my heart to another. But know that I am always your friend, Jane Porter." Tarzan sat with gaze fixed upon the floor for nearly an hour. It was evident to him from the notes that they did not know that he and Tarzan of the Apes were one and the same. "'I have given my heart to another,' he repeated over and over again to himself. Then she did not love him. How could she have pretended love, and raised him to such a pinnacle of hope, only to cast him down to such utter depths of despair? Maybe her kisses were only signs of friendship. How did he know, who knew nothing of the customs of human beings? Suddenly he arose, and bidding Darnot good night, as he had learned to do, threw himself upon the couch of ferns that had been Jane Porter's. Darnot extinguished the lamp, and lay down upon the cot. For a week they did little but rest, Darnot coaching Tarzan in French. At the end of that time the two men could converse quite easily. One night, as they were sitting within the cabin before retiring, Tarzan turned to Darnot. "'Where is America?' he said. Darnot pointed toward the northwest. "'Maybe thousands of miles across the ocean,' he replied. "'Why?' "'I am going there.' Darnot shook his head. "'It is impossible, my friend,' he said. Tarzan rose, and going to one of the cupboards, returned with a well-thumbed geography. Turning to a map of the world, he said, I have never quite understood all this. Explain it to me, please. 
when d'arnot had done so showing him that the blue represented all the water on the earth and the bits of other colors the continents and islands tarzan asked him to point out the spot where they now were d'arnot did so now point out america said tarzan and as d'arnot placed his finger upon north america tarzan smiled and laid his palm upon the page spanning the great ocean that lay between the two continents you see it is not so very far he said scarce the width of my hand d'arnot laughed how could he make the man understand then he took a pencil and made a tiny point upon the shore of africa this little mark he said is many times larger upon this map than your cabin is upon the earth do you see now how very far it is tarzan thought for a long time do any white men live in africa he asked yes where are the nearest d'arnot pointed out a spot on the shore just north of them so close asked tarzan in surprise yes said d'arnot but it is not close have they big boats to cross the ocean yes we shall go there tomorrow announced tarzan again d'arnot smiled and shook his head it is too far we should die long before we reached them do you wish to stay here then forever asked tarzan no said d'arnot then we shall start tomorrow i do not like it here longer i should rather die than remain here well answered d'arnot with a shrug i do not know my friend but that i also would rather die than remain here if if you go i shall go with you it is settled then said tarzan i shall start for america tomorrow how will you get to america without money asked d'arnot what is money inquired tarzan it took a long time to make him understand even imperfectly how do men get money he asked at last they work for it very well i will work for it then no my friend returned d'arnot you need not worry about money nor need you work for it i have enough money for two enough for twenty much more than is good for one man and you shall have all you need if ever we reach civilization so on the following day they started north along the shore each man carrying a rifle and ammunition besides bedding and some food and cooking utensils the latter seemed to tarzan a most useless encumbrance so he threw his away but you must learn to eat cooked food my friend remonstrated d'arnot no civilized men eat raw flesh there will be time enough when i reach civilization said tarzan i do not like the things and they only spoil the taste of good meat for a month they traveled north sometimes finding food in plenty and again going hungry for days they saw no signs of natives nor were they molested by wild beasts their journey was a miracle of ease tarzan asked questions and learned rapidly d'arnot taught him many of the refinements of civilization even to the use of knife and fork but sometimes tarzan would drop them in disgust and grasp his food in his strong brown hands tearing it with his molars like a wild beast then d'arnot would expostulate with him saying you must not eat like a brute tarzan while i am trying to make a gentleman of you mon dieu gentlemen do not thus it is terrible tarzan would grin sheepishly and pick up his knife and fork again but at heart he hated them on the journey he told d'arnot about the great chest he had seen the sailors bury of how he had dug it up and carried it to the gathering place of the apes and buried it there it must be the treasure chest of professor porter said d'arnot it is too bad but of course you did not know then tarzan recalled the letter written by jane to her friend the one he had stolen when they first came to his cabin and now he knew what was in the chest and what it meant to jane tomorrow we shall go back after it he announced to d'arnot go back exclaimed d'arnot but my dear fellow we have now been three weeks upon the march 
it would require three more to return to the treasure, and then, with that enormous weight which required, you say, four sailors to carry, it would be months before we had again reached this spot. It must be done, my friend, insisted Tarzan. You may go on toward civilization, and I will return for the treasure. I can go very much faster alone. I have a better plan, Tarzan, exclaimed Arnaud. We shall go on together to the nearest settlement, and there we will charter a boat and sail back down the coast for the treasure, and so transport it easily. That will be safer and quicker, and also not require us to be separated. What do you think of that plan? Very well, said Tarzan. The treasure will be there whenever we go for it, and while I could fetch it now, and catch up with you in a moon or two, I shall feel safer for you to know that you are not alone on the trail. When I see how helpless you are, Darnot, I often wonder how the human race has escaped annihilation all these ages which you tell me about. Why, Sabor, single-handed, could exterminate a thousand of you. Darnot laughed. You will think more highly of your genus when you have seen its armies and navies, its great cities, and its mighty engineering works. Then you will realize that it is mind, and not muscle, that makes the human animal greater than the mighty beasts of your jungle. Alone and unarmed, a single man is no match for any of the larger beasts, but if ten men were together, they would combine their wits and their muscles against their savage enemies, while the beasts, being unable to reason, would never think of combining against the men. Otherwise, Tarzan of the Apes, how long would you have lasted in the savage wilderness? You are right, Darnot, replied Tarzan, for if Kerchak had come to Tublat's aid that night at the Dum Dum, there would have been an end of me. But Kerchak could never think far enough ahead to take advantage of any such opportunity. Even Kayla, my mother, could never plan ahead. She simply ate what she needed when she needed it and if the supply was very scarce, even though she found plenty for several meals, she would never gather any ahead. I remember that she used to think it very silly of me to burden myself with extra food upon the march, though she was quite glad to eat it with me, if the way chanced to be barren of sustenance. "'Then you knew your mother, Tarzan?' asked Darnot in surprise. "'Yes, she was a great fine ape.' larger than I, and weighing twice as much. "'And your father?' asked Darnot. "'I did not know him. Kayla told me he was a white ape, and hairless like myself. I know now that he must have been a white man.' Darnot looked long and earnestly at his companion. "'Tarzan,' he said at length, "'it is impossible that the ape Kayla was your mother. If such a thing can be, which I doubt.' You would have inherited some of the characteristics of the ape, but you have not. You are pure man, and I should say, the offspring of highly bred and intelligent parents. Have you not the slightest clue to your past? Not the slightest, replied Tarzan. No writings in the cabin that might have told something of the lives of its original inmates? I have read everything that was in the cabin with the exception of one book, which I know now to be written in a language other than English. Possibly you can read it. Tarzan fished the little black diary from the bottom of his quiver and handed it to his companion. Darnot glanced at the title page. It is the diary of John Clayton, Lord Greystoke, an English nobleman, and it is written in French, he said. Then he proceeded to read the diary that had been written over twenty years before, and which recorded the details of the story which we already know, the story of adventure, hardships, and sorrow of John Clayton and his wife Alice, from the day they left England until an hour before he was struck down by Kerchak. Darnot read aloud. At times his voice broke, and he was forced to stop reading for the pitiful hopelessness that spoke between the lines. Occasionally he glanced at Tarzan, but the ape-man sat upon his haunches, like a carven image, his eyes fixed upon the ground. 
Only when the little babe was mentioned did the tone of the diary alter from the habitual note of despair which crept into it by degrees after the first two months upon the shore. Then the passages were tinged with a subdued happiness that was even sadder than the rest. One entry showed an almost hopeful spirit. Today our little boy is six months old. He is sitting in Alice's lap beside the table where I am writing. A happy, healthy, perfect child. Somehow, even against all reason, I seem to see him a grown man, taking his father's place in the world, the second John Clayton, and bringing added honors to the house of Greystoke. There, as though to give my prophecy the weight of his endorsement, he has grabbed my pen in his chubby fists, and with its ink-begrimed little fingers has placed the seal of his tiny fingerprints upon the page. And there, on the margin of the page, were the partially blurred imprints of four wee fingers and the outer half of the thumb. When Darnot had finished the diary, the two men sat in silence for some minutes. "'Well, Tarzan of the Apes, what think you?' asked Darnot. "'Does not this little book clear up the mystery of your parentage?' "'Why, man, you are Lord Greystoke!' "'The book speaks of but one child.' he replied. Its little skeleton lay in the crib, where it died crying for nourishment, from the first time I entered the cabin until Professor Porter's party buried it, with its father and mother, beside the cabin. No, that was the babe the book speaks of, and the mystery of my origin is deeper than before, for I have thought much of late of the possibility of that cabin having been my birthplace. I am afraid that Kayla spoke the truth," he concluded sadly. Darnot shook his head. He was unconvinced, and in his mind had sprung the determination to prove the correctness of his theory, for he had discovered the key which alone could unlock the mystery, or consign it forever to the realms of the unfathomable. A week later the two men came suddenly upon a clearing in the forest. In the distance were several buildings surrounded by a strong palisade. Between them and the enclosure stretched a cultivated field in which a number of negroes were working. The two halted at the edge of the jungle. Tarzan fitted his bow with a poisoned arrow, but Darnot placed a hand upon his arm. "'What would you do, Tarzan?' he asked. "'They will try to kill us if they see us,' replied Tarzan. "'I prefer to be the killer.' "'Maybe they are friends,' suggested Tarnot. They are black, was Tarzan's only reply. And again he drew back his shaft. You must not, Tarzan, cried Darnot. White men do not kill wantonly. Mon Dieu, but you have much to learn. I pity the ruffian who crosses you, my wild man. When I take you to Paris, I will have my hands full keeping your neck from beneath the guillotine. Tarzan lowered his bow and smiled. I do not know why I should kill the blacks back there in my jungle, but not kill them here. Suppose Numa the lion should spring out upon us, I should say then, I presume, Good morning, Monsieur Numa, how is Madame Numa, eh? Wait until the blacks spring upon you, replied Darnot. Then you may kill them. Do not assume that men are your enemies until they prove it. Come, said Tarzan. Let us go and present ourselves to be killed. And he started straight across the field, his head held high and the tropical sun beating upon his smooth brown skin. Behind him came Darnot, clothed in some garments which had been discarded at the cabin by Clayton when the officers of the French cruiser had fitted him out in more presentable fashion. Presently one of the blacks looked up, and beholding Tarzan, turned, shrieking toward the palisade. In an instant the air was filled with cries of terror from the fleeing gardeners, but before any had reached the palisade, a white man emerged from the enclosure, rifle in hand, to discover the cause of the emotion. What he saw brought his rifle to his shoulder, and Tarzan of the Apes would have felt cold lead once again, had not Darnot cried loudly to the man with the leveled gun, "'Do not fire! We are friends!' "'Halt, then!' was the reply. "'Stop, Tarzan!' cried Darnot. "'He thinks we are enemies.' Tarzan dropped into a walk, 
and together he and D'Arnot advanced toward the white man by the gate. The latter eyed them in puzzled bewilderment. "'What manner of men are you?' he asked in French. "'White men,' replied D'Arnot. "'We have been lost in the jungle for a long time.' The man had lowered his rifle and now advanced with outstretched hand. "'I am Father Constantine of the French mission here,' he said, "'and I am glad to welcome you.' "'This is Monsieur Tarzan, Father Constantine,' replied D'Arnot, indicating the ape-man, and as the priest extended his hand to Tarzan, D'Arnot added, "'And I am Paul D'Arnot of the French Navy.' Father Constantine took the hand which Tarzan extended in imitation of the priest's act, while the latter took in the superb physique and handsome face in one quick, keen glance. And thus came Tarzan of the Apes to the first outpost of civilization. For a week they remained there, and the ape-man, keenly observant, learned much of the ways of men. Meanwhile black women sewed white duck garments for himself and Darnot, so that they might continue their journey properly clothed. End of chapter Chapter 26 of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs. Chapter 26 The Height of Civilization. Another month brought them to a little group of buildings at the mouth of a wide river, and there Tarzan saw many boats, and was filled with the timidity of the wild thing by the sight of many men. Gradually he became accustomed to the strange noises and the odd ways of civilization, so that presently none might know that two short months before, this handsome Frenchman in immaculate white ducks, who laughed and chatted with the gayest of them, had been swinging naked through primeval forests to pounce upon some unwary victim, which, raw, was to fill his savage belly. The knife and fork so contemptuously flung aside a month before, Tarzan now manipulated as exquisitely as did the polished D'Arnot. So apt a pupil had he been that the young Frenchman had labored assiduously to make of Tarzan of the Apes a polished gentleman in so far as nicety of manners and speech were concerned. "'God has made you a gentleman at heart, my friend,' Darnot had said. "'But we want his works to show upon the exterior also.' As soon as they had reached the little port, Darnot had cabled his government of his safety, and requested a three months' leave, which had been granted. He had also cabled his bankers for funds, and the enforced wait of a month, under which both chafed, was due to their inability to charter a vessel for the return to Tarzan's jungle after the treasure. During their stay at the coast town, Monsieur Tarzan became the wonder of both whites and blacks because of several occurrences which to Tarzan seemed the merest of nothings. Once a huge black, crazed by drink, had run amuck and terrorized the town, until his evil star had led him to where the black-haired French giant lolled upon the veranda of the hotel. Mounting the broad steps, with brandished knife, the negro made straight for a party of four men sitting at a table, sipping the inevitable absinthe. Shouting in alarm, the four took to their heels, and then the black spied Tarzan. With a roar he charged the ape-man, while half a hundred heads peered from sheltering windows and doorways to witness the butchering of the poor Frenchman by the giant black. Tarzan met the rush with the fighting smile that the joy of battle always brought to his lips. As the negro closed upon him, steel muscles gripped the black wrist of the uplifted knife-hand, and a single swift wrench left the hand dangling below a broken bone. With the pain and surprise, the madness left the black man, and as Tarzan dropped back into his chair, the fellow turned, crying with agony, and dashed wildly toward the native village. On another occasion, as Tarzan and D'Arnot sat at dinner with a number of other whites, the talk fell upon lions and lion hunting. 
opinion was divided as to the bravery of the king of beasts, some maintaining that he was an errant coward, but all agreeing that it was with a feeling of greater security that they gripped their express rifles when the monarch of the jungle roared about a camp at night. D'Arnot and Tarzan had agreed that his past be kept secret, and so none other than the French officer knew of the ape-man's familiarity with the beasts of the jungle. "'Monsieur Tarzan has not expressed himself,' said one of the party. "'A man of his prowess who has spent some time in Africa, as I understand Monsieur Tarzan has, must have had experiences with lions, yes?' "'Some,' replied Tarzan dryly. "'Enough to know that each of you are right in your judgment of the characteristics of the lions you have met.' But one might as well judge all blacks by the fellow who ran amuck last week, or decide that all whites are cowards because one has met a cowardly white. There is as much individually among the lower orders, gentlemen, as there is among ourselves. Today we may go out and stumble upon a lion which is over-timid. He runs away from us. Tomorrow we may meet his uncle or his twin brother and our friends wonder why we do not return from the jungle. For myself, I always assume that a lion is ferocious, and so I am never caught off my guard. If there would be little pleasure in hunting, retorted the first speaker, if one is afraid of the thing he hunts. Darnot smiled. Tarzan afraid. I do not exactly understand what you mean by fear, said Tarzan. Like lions, fear is a different thing in different men, but to me the only pleasure in the hunt is the knowledge that the hunted thing has power to harm me as much as I have to harm him. If I went out with a couple of rifles and a gun-bearer, and twenty or thirty beaters, to hunt a lion, I should not feel that the lion had much chance, and so the pleasure of the hunt would be lessened in proportion to the increased safety which I felt." Then I am to take it that Monsieur Tarzan would prefer to go naked into the jungle, armed only with a jackknife, to kill the king of beasts, <laughs> laughed the other, good-naturedly, but with the merest touch of sarcasm in his tone. And a piece of rope, added Tarzan. And then the deep roar of a lion sounded from the distant jungle, as though to challenge whoever dared enter the lists with him. There is your opportunity, Monsieur Tarzan bantered the Frenchman. "'I am not hungry,' said Tarzan simply. The men laughed, all but Darnot. He alone knew that a savage beast had spoken its simple reason through the lips of the ape-man. "'But you are afraid, just as any of us would be, to go out there naked, armed only with a knife and a piece of rope,' said the banterer. "'Is it not so?' "'No,' replied Tarzan. Only a fool performs any act without reason. Five thousand francs is a reason, said the other. I wager that amount you cannot bring back a lion from the jungle, under the conditions we have named, naked and armed only with a knife and a piece of rope. Tarzan glanced toward Darnot and nodded his head. Make it ten thousand, said Darnot. Done, replied the other. Tarzan arose. I shall have to leave my clothes at the edge of the settlement, so that if I do not return before daylight I shall have something to wear through the streets. "'You are not going now,' exclaimed the wagerer. "'At night?' "'Why not?' asked Tarzan. "'Numa walks abroad at night. It will be easier to find him.' "'No,' said the other. "'I do not want your blood upon my hands. It will be foolhardy enough if you go forth by day.' I shall go now, replied Tarzan, and went to his room for his knife and rope. The men accompanied him to the edge of the jungle, where he left his clothes in a small storehouse. But when he would have entered the blackness of the undergrowth, they tried to dissuade him, and the wagerer was most insistent of all that he abandon his foolhardy venture. I will exceed that you have won, he said, and the ten thousand francs are yours if you will but give up this foolish attempt, which can only end in your death. Tarzan laughed, and in another moment the jungle had swallowed him. The men stood silent for some moments, and then slowly turned, 
and walked back to the hotel veranda. Tarzan had no sooner entered the jungle than he took to the trees, and it was with a feeling of exultant freedom that he swung once more through the forest branches. This was life! Ah, how he loved it! Civilization held nothing like this in its narrow and circumscribed sphere, hemmed in by restrictions and conventionalities. Even clothes were a hindrance and a nuisance. At last he was free. He had not realized what a prisoner he had been. How easy it would be to circle back to the coast, and then make toward the south and his own jungle and cabin. Now he caught the scent of Numa, for he was traveling upwind. Presently his quick ears detected the familiar sound of padded feet, and the brushing of a huge fur-clad body through the undergrowth. Tarzan came quietly above the unsuspecting beast, and silently stalked him until he came into a little patch of moonlight. Then the quick noose settled and tightened around the tawny throat, and, as he had done it a hundred times in the past, Tarzan made fast the end to a strong branch, and while the beast fought and clawed for freedom, dropped to the ground behind him, and leaping upon the great back, plunged his long thin blade a dozen times into the fierce heart. Then, with his foot upon the carcass of Numa, he raised his voice in the awesome victory cry of his savage tribe. For a moment Tarzan stood irresolute, swayed by conflicting emotions of loyalty to Darnot and a mighty lust for the freedom of his own jungle. At last the vision of a beautiful face and the memory of warm lips crushed to his dissolved the fascinating picture he had been drawing of his old life. The ape-man threw the warm carcass of Numa across his shoulders and took to the trees once more. The men upon the veranda had sat for an hour, almost in silence. They had tried ineffectually to converse on various subjects, and always the thing uppermost in the mind of each had caused the conversation to lapse. Mon Dieu! said the wagerer at length. I can endure it no longer. I am going into the jungle with my express and bring back that madman. I will go with you, said one. And I, and I, and I, chorused the others. As though the suggestion had broken the spell of some horrid nightmare, they hastened to their various quarters, and presently were headed toward the jungle, each one heavily armed. God, what was that? suddenly cried one of the party, an Englishman, as Tarzan's savage cry came faintly to their ears. "'I heard the same thing once before,' said a Belgian, "'when I was in the gorilla country. My carrier said it was the cry of a great bull-ape who has made a kill.' Darnot remembered Clayton's description of the awful roar with which Tarzan had announced his kills and he half-smiled in spite of the horror, which filled him to think that the uncanny sound could have issued from a human throat, from the lips of his friend. As the party stood finally near the edge of the jungle, debating as to the best distribution of their forces, they were startled by a low laugh near them, and turning, beheld advancing toward them a giant figure bearing a dead lion upon its broad shoulders. Even Darnot was thunderstruck for it seemed impossible that the man could have so quickly dispatched the lion with the pitiful weapons he had taken, or that alone he could have borne the huge carcass through the tangled jungle. The men crowded about Tarzan with many questions, but his only answer was a laughing deprecation of his feet. To Tarzan it was as though one should eulogize a butcher for his heroism in killing a cow, for Tarzan had killed so often for food and for self-preservation that the act seemed anything but remarkable to him. But he was indeed a hero in the eyes of these men, men accustomed to hunting big game. Incidentally, he had won ten thousand francs, for Darnot insisted that he keep it all. This was a very important item to Tarzan, who was just commencing to realize the power which lay beyond the little pieces of metal and paper which always changed hands when human beings rode, or ate, or slept, or clothed themselves, or drank or worked or played, or sheltered themselves from the rain or cold or sun. It had become evident to Tarzan that without money one must die. Darnot had told him not to worry, since he had more than enough for both, 
but the ape-man was learning many things, and one of them was that people looked down upon one who had accepted money from another without giving something of equal value in exchange. Shortly after the episode of the lion hunt, D'Arnot succeeded in chartering an ancient tub for the coastwise trip to Tarzan's landlocked harbor. It was a happy morning for them both when the little vessel weighed anchor and made for the open sea. The trip to the beach was uneventful, and the morning after they dropped anchor before the cabin, Tarzan, garbed once more in his jungle regalia and carrying a spade, set out alone for the amphitheater of the apes where lay the treasure. Late the next day he returned, bearing the great chest upon his shoulder, and at sunrise the little vessel worked through the harbor's mouth and took up her northward journey. Three weeks later Tarzan and D'Arnot were passengers on board a French steamer born for Lyon, and after a few days in that city D'Arnot took Tarzan to Paris. The ape man was anxious to proceed to America, but D'Arnot insisted that he must accompany him to Paris first, nor would he divulge the nature of the urgent necessity upon which he based his demand. One of the first things which D'Arnot accomplished after their arrival was to arrange to visit a high official of the police department, an old friend, and to take Tarzan with him. Adroitly, D'Arnot led the conversation from point to point, until the policeman had explained to the interested Tarzan many of the methods in vogue for apprehending and identifying criminals. Not the least interesting to Tarzan was the part played by fingerprints in this fascinating science. "'But of what value are these imprints?' asked Tarzan, when, after a few years, the lines upon the fingers are entirely changed by the wearing out of the old tissue and the growth of new. The lines never change, replied the official. From infancy to senility, the fingerprints of an individual change only in size, except as injuries alter the loops and whorls. But if imprints have been taken of the thumb and four fingers of both hands, one must needs lose all entirely to escape identification. It is marvellous, exclaimed Arnaud. I wonder what the lines upon my own fingers may resemble. We can soon see, replied the police officer, and ringing a bell he summoned an assistant to whom he issued a few directions. The man left the room, but presently returned with a little hardwood box which he placed on his superior's desk. Now, said the officer, you shall have your fingerprints in a second. He drew from the little case a square of plate glass, a little tube of thick ink, a rubber roller, and a few snowy white cards. Squeezing a drop of ink onto the glass, he spread it back and forth with a rubber roller until the entire surface of the glass was coated to his satisfaction with a very thin and uniform layer of ink. Place the four fingers of your right hand upon the glass, thus he said to Darnot. Now the thumb. That is right. Now place them in just the same position upon this card. Here, no, no, a little to the right. We must leave room for the thumb and the fingers of the left hand. There, that's it. Now the same with the left. Come, Tarzan, cried Darnot. Let's see what your whorls look like. Tarzan complied readily, asking many questions of the officer during the operation. Do fingerprints show racial characteristics? he asked. Could you determine, for example, solely from fingerprints, whether the subject was Negro or Caucasian? I think not, replied the officer. Could the fingerprints of an ape be detected from those of a man? Probably, because the apes would be far simpler than those of the higher organism. But a cross between an ape and a man might show the characteristics of either progenitor, continued Tarzan. Yes, I should think likely, responded the official. But the science has not progressed sufficiently to render it exact enough in such matters. I should hate to trust its findings further than to differentiate between individuals. There it is absolute. No two people born into the world probably have ever had identical lines upon all their digits. It is very doubtful if any single fingerprint will ever be exactly duplicated by any finger other than the one which originally made it. 
Does the comparison require much time or labor? asked Arnaud. Ordinarily, but a few moments, if the impressions are distinct. Darnot drew a little black book from his pocket and commenced turning the pages. Tarzan looked at the book in surprise. How did Darnot come to have his book? Presently Darnot stopped at a page on which were five tiny little smudges. He handed the open book to the policeman. Are these imprints similar to mine or Monsieur Tarzan's, or can you say that they are identical with either? The officer drew a powerful glass from his desk and examined all three specimens carefully, making notations, meanwhile, upon a pad of paper. Tarzan realized now what was the meaning of their visit to the police officer. The answer to his life's riddle lay in these tiny marks. With tense nerves he sat leaning forward in his chair, but suddenly he relaxed and dropped back, smiling. D'Arnaud looked at him in surprise. You forget that for twenty years the dead body of the child who made those fingerprints lay in the cabin of his father, and that all my life I have seen it lying there, said Tarzan bitterly. The policeman looked up in astonishment. Then go ahead, Captain, with your examination, said Darnot. We will tell you the story later, provided Monsieur Tarzan is agreeable. Tarzan nodded his head. But you are mad, my dear Darnot he insisted. Those little fingers are buried on the west coast of Africa. I do not know as to that, Tarzan, replied Darnot. It is possible, but if you are not the son of John Clayton, then how in heaven's name did you come into that god-forsaken jungle where no white man other than John Clayton had ever set foot? You forget, Kayla, said Tarzan. I do not even consider her replied Darnot. The friends had walked to the broad window overlooking the boulevard as they talked. For some time they stood there, gazing out upon the busy throng beneath, each wrapped in his own thoughts. It takes some time to compare fingerprints, thought Darnot, turning to look at the police officer. To his astonishment he saw the official leaning back in his chair, hastily scanning the contents of the little black diary. Darnot coughed. The policeman looked up, and, catching his eye, raised his finger to admonish silence. Darnot turned back to the window, and presently the police officer spoke. Gentlemen, he said. Both turned toward him. There is evidently a great deal at stake which must hinge to a greater or lesser extent upon the absolute correctness of this comparison. I therefore ask that you leave the entire matter in my hands until Monsieur Desquerc, our expert, returns. It will be but a matter of a few days. I had hoped to know at once, said Darnot. Monsieur Tarzan sails for America tomorrow. I will promise that you can cable him a report within two weeks, replied the officer. But what it will be I dare not say. There are resemblances... Yet, well, we had better leave it for Monsieur de Kerk to solve. End of chapter. Chapter 27 of Tarzan of the Apes. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 27 The Giant Again A taxi cab drew up before an old-fashioned residence upon the outskirts of Baltimore. A man of about forty well-built and with strong, regular features, stepped out, and paying the chauffeur, dismissed him. A moment later the passenger was entering the library of the old home. "'Ah, Mr. Candler!' exclaimed an old man, rising to greet him. "'Good evening, my dear professor!' cried the man, extending a cordial hand. "'Who admitted you?' asked the professor. "'Esmeralda!' "'Then she will acquaint Jane with the fact that you are here,' said the old man. 
No, Professor, replied Candler, for I came primarily to see you. Ah, I am honored, said Professor Porter. Professor, continued Robert Candler with great deliberation, as though carefully weighing his words, I have come this evening to speak with you about Jane. You know my aspirations, and you have been generous enough to approve my suit. Professor Archimedes Q. Porter fidgeted in his armchair. The subject always made him uncomfortable. He could not understand why. Candler was a splendid match. But Jane, continued Candler, I cannot understand her. She puts me off first on one ground and then another. I have always the feeling that she breathes a sigh of relief every time I bid her good-bye. Tut, tut, said Professor Porter. Tut, tut, Mr. Candler. Jane is a most obedient daughter. She will do precisely as I tell her. Then I can still count on your support? asked Candler, a tone of relief marking his voice. Certainly, sir, certainly, sir, exclaimed Professor Porter. How could you doubt it? There is young Clayton, you know, suggested Candler. He has been hanging about for months. I don't know that Jane cares for him, but beside his title they say he has inherited a very considerable estate from his father, and it might not be strange if he finally won her, unless... And Candler paused. Tut, tut, Mr. Candler, unless what? Unless you see fit to request that Jane and I be married at once, said Candler, slowly and distinctly. I have already suggested to Jane that it would be desirable, said Professor Porter, sadly, for we can no longer afford to keep up this house and live as her associations demand. What was her reply? asked Candler. She said she was not ready to marry anyone yet, replied Professor Porter, and that we could go and live upon the farm in northern Wisconsin which her mother left her. It is a little more than self-supporting. The tenants have always made a living from it, and been able to send Jane a trifle beside each year. If she is planning on our going up there the first of the week, Philander and Mr. Clayton have already gone to get things in readiness for us. Clayton has gone there? exclaimed Candler, visibly chagrined. Why was I not told? I would gladly have gone and seen that every comfort was provided. Jane feels that we are already too much in your debt, Mr. Candler, said Professor Porter. Candler was about to reply, when the sound of footsteps came from the hall without, and Jane entered the room. Oh, I beg your pardon, she exclaimed, pausing on the threshold. I thought you were alone, Papa. It is only I, Jane, said Candler, who had risen. Won't you come in and join the family group? We were just speaking of you. Thank you, said Jane, entering and taking the chair Candler placed for her. I only wanted to tell Papa that Toby is coming down from the college tomorrow to pack his books. I want you to be sure, Papa, to indicate all that you can do without until fall. Please don't carry this entire library to Wisconsin, as you would have carried it to Africa if I had not put my foot down. Was Toby here? asked Professor Porter. Yes, I just left him. He and Esmeralda are exchanging religious experiences on the back porch now. Tut, tut, I must see him at once, cried the professor. Excuse me just a moment, children. And the old man hastened from the room. As soon as he was out of earshot, Candler turned to Jane. See here, Jane, he said bluntly. How long is this thing going on like this? You haven't refused to marry me, but you haven't promised either. I want to get the license tomorrow, so that we can be married quietly before you leave for Wisconsin. I don't care for any fuss or feathers, and I'm sure you don't either. The girl turned cold, but she held her head bravely. Your father wishes it, you know, added Candler. Yes, I know. She spoke scarcely above a whisper. Do you realize that you are buying me, Mr. Candler? She said finally, and in a cold, level voice. Buying me for a few paltry dollars? Of course you do, Robert Candler. 
and the hope of just such a contingency was in your mind when you loaned Papa the money for that hair-brained escapade, which but for a most mysterious circumstance would have been surprisingly successful. But you, Mr. Candler, would have been the most surprised. You had no idea that the venture would succeed. You are too good a businessman for that. And you are too good a businessman to loan money for buried treasure-seeking, or to loan money without security, unless you had some special object in view. You knew that without security you had a greater hold on the honor of the porters than with it. You knew the one best way to force me to marry you without seeming to force me. You have never mentioned the loan. In any other man I should have thought that the prompting of a magnanimous and noble character. But you are deep, Mr. Robert Candler. I know you better than you think I know you. I shall certainly marry you if there is no other way. But let us understand each other once and for all." While she spoke, Robert Candler had alternately flushed and paled, and when she ceased speaking he arose, and with a cynical smile upon his strong face, said, "'You surprise me, Jane. I thought you had more self-control, more pride. Of course you are right. I am buying you, and I knew that you knew it, and I thought you would prefer to pretend that it was otherwise.' I should have thought your self-respect and your porter pride would have shrunk from admitting, even to yourself, that you were a bought woman. But have it your own way, dear girl," he added lightly. I am going to have you, and that is all that interests me. Without a word the girl turned and left the room. Jane was not married before she left with her father and Esmeralda for her little Wisconsin farm and as she coldly bid Robert Candler good-bye as her train pulled out, he called to her that he would join them in a week or two. At their destination they were met by Clayton and Mr. Philander, in a huge touring car belonging to the former, and quickly whirled away through the dense northern woods towards the little farm which the girl had not visited before since childhood. The farmhouse, which stood on a little elevation some hundred yards from the tenant house, had undergone a complete transformation during the three weeks that Clayton and Mr. Philander had been there. The former had imported a small army of carpenters and plasterers, plumbers and painters, from a distant city, and what had been but a dilapidated shell when they reached it was now a cozy little two-story house filled with every modern convenience procurable in so short a time. "'Why, Mr. Clayton, what have you done?' cried Jane Porter her heart sinking within her as she realized the probable size of the expenditure that had been made. Shh! cautioned Clayton. Don't let your father guess. If you don't tell him, then he will never notice, and I simply couldn't think of him living in the terrible squalor and sordidness which Mr. Philander and I found. It was so little when I would like to do so much, Jane. For his sake, please, never mention it. But you know that we can't repay you cried the girl. Why do you want to put me under such terrible obligations? Don't, Jane, said Clayton sadly. If it had been just you, believe me, I wouldn't have done it, for I knew from the start that it would only hurt me in your eyes, but I couldn't think of that dear old man living in the hole we found here. Won't you please believe that I did it just for him, and give me that little crumb of pleasure at least? "'I do believe you, Mr. Clayton,' said the girl, "'because I know you are big enough and generous enough to have done it just for him. And, oh, Cecil, I wish I might repay you as you deserve, as you would wish.' "'Why can't you, Jane?' "'Because I love another.' "'Candler?' "'No. But you are going to marry him. He told me as much before I left Baltimore.' The girl winced. I do not love him, she said, almost proudly. Is it because of the money, Jane? She nodded. Then am I so much less desirable than Candler? I have money enough and far more for every need, he said bitterly. I do not love you, Cecil, she said, but I respect you. If I must disgrace myself by such a bargain with any man, I prefer that it be one I already despise. 
I should loathe the man to whom I sold myself without love, whomsoever he might be. You will be happier, she concluded, alone with my respect and friendship, than with me and my contempt. He did not press the matter further. But if ever a man had murder in his heart, it was William Cecil Clayton, Lord Greystoke, when, a week later, Robert Candler drew up before the farmhouse in his purring six-cylinder. A week passed, a tense, uneventful, but uncomfortable week for all the inmates of the little Wisconsin farmhouse. Candler was insistent that Jane marry him at once. At length she gave in from sheer loathing of the continued and hateful importuning. It was agreed that on the morrow Candler was to drive to town and bring back the license and a minister. Clayton had wanted to leave as soon as the plan was announced, but the girl's tired, hopeless look kept him. He could not desert her. Something might happen yet, he tried to console himself by thinking, and in his heart he knew that it would require but a tiny spark to turn his hatred for Candler into the bloodlust of the killer. Early the next morning Candler set out for town. In the east smoke could be seen lying low over the forest, for a fire had been raging for a week not far from them, but the wind still lay in the west, and no danger threatened them. About noon Jane started off for a walk. She would not let Clayton accompany her. She wanted to be alone, she said, and he respected her wishes. In the house, Professor Porter and Mr. Philander were immersed in the absorbing discussion of some weighty scientific problem. Esmeralda dozed in the kitchen, and Clayton, heavy-eyed after a sleepless night, threw himself down upon the couch in the living room and soon dropped into a fitful slumber. To the east the black smoke clouds rose higher into the heavens. Suddenly they eddied, and then commenced to drift rapidly toward the west. On and on they came. The inmates of the tenant house were gone, for it was market day, and none was there to see the rapid approach of the fiery demon. Soon the flames had spanned the road to the south and cut off Candler's return. A little fluctuation of the wind now carried the path of the forest fire to the north, then blew back, and the flames nearly stood still as though held in leash by some master hand. Suddenly, out of the northeast, a great black car came careening down the road. With a jolt it stopped before the cottage, and a black-haired giant leaped out to run up onto the porch. Without a pause he rushed into the house. On the couch lay Clayton. The man started in surprise, but with a bound was at the side of the sleeping man. Shaking him roughly by the shoulder, he cried, "'My God, Clayton, are you all mad here? Don't you know you are nearly surrounded by fire?' Where is Miss Porter? Clayton sprang to his feet. He did not recognize the man, but he understood the words and was upon the veranda in a bound. Scott! he cried, and then dashing back into the house. Jane! Jane! Where are you? In an instant Esmeralda, Professor Porter, and Mr. Philander had joined the two men. Where is Miss Jane? cried Clayton, seizing Esmeralda by the shoulders and shaking her roughly. Oh, Gabrielle, Mr. Clayton, she done gone for a walk. Hasn't she come back yet? And, without waiting for a reply, Clayton dashed out into the yard, followed by the others. Which way did she go? cried the black-haired giant of Esmeralda. Down that road! cried the frightened woman, pointing toward the south where a mighty wall of roaring flames shut out the view. Put these people in the other car! shouted the stranger to Clayton. I saw one as I drove up, and get them out of here by the north road. Leave my car here. If I find Miss Porter, we shall need it. If I don't, no one will need it. Do as I say, as Clayton hesitated, and then he saw the lithe figure bound away across the clearing toward the northwest where the forest still stood, untouched by flame. In each rose the unaccountable feeling that a great responsibility had been raised from their shoulders a kind of implicit confidence in the power of the stranger to save Jane if she could be saved. "'Who was that?' asked Professor Porter. "'I do not know,' replied Clayton. "'He called me by name, and he knew Jane, for he asked for her, and he called Esmeralda by name.' 
"'There was something most startlingly familiar about him,' exclaimed Mr. Flander. "'And yet, bless me, I know I never saw him before.' "'Tut, tut!' cried Professor Porter. "'Most remarkable. Who could it have been? And why do I feel that Jane is safe, now that he has set out in search of her?' "'I can't tell you, Professor,' said Clayton soberly. "'But I know I have the same uncanny feeling.' "'But come,' he cried, "'we must get out of here ourselves, or we shall be shut off.' And the party hastened toward Clayton's car. When Jane turned to retrace her steps homeward, she was alarmed to note how near the stroke of the forest fire seemed, and as she hastened onward her alarm became almost a panic when she perceived that the rushing flames were rapidly forcing their way between herself and the cottage. At length she was compelled to turn into the dense thicket and attempt to force her way to the west, in an effort to circle around the flames and reach the house. In a short time the futility of her attempt became apparent, and then her one hope lay in retracing her steps to the road and flying for her life to the south toward the town. The twenty minutes that it took her to regain the road was all that had been needed to cut off her retreat as effectually as her advance had been cut off before. A short run down the road brought her to a horrified stand, for there before her was another wall of flame. An arm of the main conflagration had shot out a half-mile south of its parent to embrace this tiny strip of road in its implacable clutches. Jane knew that it was useless again to attempt to force her way through the undergrowth. She had tried it once and failed. Now she realized that it would be but a matter of minutes ere the whole space between the north and the south would be a seething mass of billowing flames. Calmly the girl kneeled down in the dust of the roadway, and prayed for strength to meet her fate bravely, and for the delivery of her father and her friends from death. Suddenly she heard her name being called aloud through the forest. "'Jane! Jane Porter!' It rang strong and clear, but in a strange voice. "'Here!' she called in reply. "'Here! In the roadway!' Then through the branches of the trees she saw a figure swinging with the speed of a squirrel. A veering of the wind blew a cloud of smoke about them, and she could no longer see the man who was speeding toward her, but suddenly she felt a great arm about her. Then she was lifted up, and she felt the rushing of the wind and the occasional brush of a branch as she was borne along. She opened her eyes. Far below her lay the undergrowth and the hard earth. About her was the waving foliage of the forest. From tree to tree swung the giant figure which bore her, and it seemed to Jane that she was living over in a dream the experience that had been hers in that far African jungle. Oh, if it were but the same man who had borne her so swiftly through the tangled verdure on that other day! But that was impossible! Yet who else in all the world was there with the strength and agility to do what this man was now doing? She stole a sudden glance at the face close to hers, and then she gave a little frightened gasp, it was he. My forest man, she murmured. No, I must be delirious. Yes, your man, Jane Porter, your savage, primeval man, come out of the jungle to claim his mate, the woman who ran away from him, he added almost fiercely. I did not run away, she whispered. I would only consent to leave when they had waited a week for you to return. They had come to a point beyond the fire now, and he had turned back to the clearing. Side by side they were walking toward the cottage. The wind had changed once more, and the fire was burning back upon itself. Another hour like that, and it will be burned out. "'Why did you not return?' she asked. "'I was nursing Darnot. He was badly wounded.' "'Ah, I knew it!' she exclaimed. They said you had gone to join the blacks, that they were your people. He laughed. But you did not believe them, Jane. No. What shall I call you? she asked. What is your name? I was Tarzan of the Apes when you first knew me, he said. Tarzan of the Apes, she cried. And that was your note I answered when I left? Yes. Whose did you think it was? I did not know, only that it could not be yours, 
for Tarzan of the Apes had written in English, and you cannot understand a word of any language. Again he laughed. It is a long story, but it was I who wrote what I could not speak, and now Darnot has made matters worse by teaching me to speak French instead of English. Come, he added, jump into my car, we must overtake your father, they are only a little way ahead. As they drove along, he said, Then when you said in your note to Tarzan of the apes that you loved another, you might have met me? I might have, she answered simply. But in Baltimore, oh, how I have searched for you. They told me you would possibly be married by now, that a man named Candler had come up here to wed you. Is that true? Yes. Do you love him? No. Do you love me? She buried her face in her hands. I am promised to another. I cannot answer you, Tarzan of the Apes, she cried. You have answered. Now, tell me why you would marry one you do not love. My father owes him money. Suddenly there came back to Tarzan the memory of the letter he had read and the name Robert Candler, and the hinted trouble which he had been unable to understand then, he smiled. If your father had not lost the treasure, you would not feel forced to keep your promise to this man Candler? I could ask him to release me. And if he refused? I have given my promise. He was silent for a moment. The car was plunging along the uneven road at a reckless pace, for the fire showed threateningly at their right, and another change of the wind might sweep it on with raging fury across this one avenue of escape. Finally they passed the danger point, and Tarzan reduced their speed. "'Suppose I should ask him,' ventured Tarzan. "'He would scarcely accede to the demand of a stranger,' said the girl, "'especially one who wanted me himself.' "'Turcoz did.' said Tarzan grimly. Jane shuddered, and looked fearfully up at the giant figure beside her, for she knew that he meant the great anthropoid he had killed in her defense. "'This is not the African jungle,' she said. "'You are no longer a savage beast. You are a gentleman, and gentlemen do not kill in cold blood.' "'I am still a wild beast at heart,' he said in a low voice, as though to himself." Again they were silent for a time. "'Jane,' said the man, at length, "'if you were free, would you marry me?' She did not reply at once, but he waited patiently. The girl was trying to collect her thoughts. What did she know of this strange creature at her side? What did he know of himself? Who was he? Who? His parents? Why, his very name echoed his mysterious origin and his savage life. He had no name. Could she be happy with this jungle waif? Could she find anything in common with a husband, whose life had been spent at the treetops of an African wilderness, frolicking and fighting with fierce anthropoids, tearing his food from the quivering flank of fresh-killed prey, sinking his strong teeth into raw flesh, and tearing away his portion while his mates growled and fought about him for their share? Could he ever rise to her social sphere? Could she bear to think of sinking to his? Would either be happy in such a horrible misalliance? "'You do not answer,' he said. "'Do you shrink from wounding me?' "'I do not know what answer to make,' said Jane sadly. "'I do not know my own mind.' "'You do not love me, then?' he asked in a level tone. "'Do not ask me.' You will be happier without me. You were never meant for the formal restrictions and conventionalities of society. Civilization would become irksome to you, and in a little while you would long for the freedom of your old life, a life to which I am as totally unfitted as you to mine. I think I understand you, he replied quietly. I shall not urge you, for I would rather see you happy than to be happy myself. I see now that you could not be happy with an ape. 
There was just the faintish tinge of bitterness in his voice. Don't, she remonstrated. Don't say that. You do not understand. But before she could go on, a sudden turn in the road brought them into the midst of a little hamlet. Before them stood Clayton's car, surrounded by the party he had brought from the cottage. End of chapter Chapter 28 The Conclusion to Tarzan of the Apes This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. This recording is by Mark Smith of Simpsonville, South Carolina. Tarzan of the Apes by Edgar Rice Burroughs Chapter 28 Conclusion at the sight of Jane, cries of relief and delight broke from every lip, and as Tarzan's car stopped beside the other, Professor Porter caught his daughter in his arms. For a moment no one noticed Tarzan sitting silently in his seat. Clayton was the first to remember, and, turning, held out his hand. "'How can we ever thank you?' he exclaimed. "'You have saved us all. You called me by name at the cottage, but I do not seem to recall yours.' though there is something very familiar about you. It is as though I had known you well under very different conditions a long time ago." Tarzan smiled as he took the proffered hand. "'You are quite right, Monsieur Clayton,' he said, in French. "'You will pardon me if I do not speak to you in English. I am just learning it, and while I understand it fairly well, I speak it very poorly.' "'But who are you?' insisted Clayton, speaking in French this time himself. Tarzan of the Apes Clayton started back in surprise. By Jove! he exclaimed. It is true! And Professor Porter and Mr. Philander pressed forward to add their thanks to Clayton's, and to voice their surprise and pleasure at seeing their jungle friend so far from his savage home. The party now entered the modest little hostelry, where Clayton soon made arrangements for their entertainment. They were sitting in the little, stuffy parlor when the distant chugging of an approaching automobile caught their attention. Mr. Philander, who was sitting near the window, looked out as the car drew in sight, finally stopping beside the other automobiles. "'Bless me,' said Mr. Philander, a shade of annoyance in his tone. "'It is Mr. Candler. I had hoped, um, I had thought of... Oh, how very happy we should be that he was not caught in the fire, he ended lamely. Tut, tut, Mr. Philander, said Professor Porter. Tut, tut, I have often admonished my pupils to count ten before speaking. Were I you, Mr. Philander, I should count at least a thousand, and then maintain a discreet silence. Bless me, yes, acquiesced Mr. Philander. But who is the clerical appearing gentleman with him? Jane blanched. Clayton moved uneasily in his chair. Professor Porter removed his spectacles nervously and breathed upon them, but replaced them on his nose without wiping. The ubiquitous Esmeralda grunted. Only Tarzan did not comprehend. Presently Robert Candler burst into the room. Thank God! he cried. I feared the worst until I saw your car, Clayton. I was cut off on the south road and had to go away back to town, and then strike east to this road. I thought we'd never reach the cottage. No one seemed to enthuse much. Tarzan eyed Robert Candler as Sabor eyes her prey. Jane glanced at him and coughed nervously. Mr. Candler, she said, this is Monsieur Tarzan, an old friend. Candler turned and extended his hand. Tarzan rose and bowed as only D'Arnot could have taught a gentleman to do it, but he did not seem to see Candler's hand. Nor did Candler appear to notice the oversight. "'This is the Reverend Mr. Toosley, Jane,' said Candler, turning to the clerical party behind him. "'Mr. Toosley, Miss Porter.' Mr. Toosley bowed and beamed. Candler introduced him to the others. We can have the ceremony at once, Jane, said Candler. 
Then you and I can catch the midnight train in town. Tarzan understood the plan instantly. He glanced out of half-closed eyes at Jane, but he did not move. The girl hesitated. The room was tense with the silence of taut nerves. All eyes turned toward Jane, awaiting her reply. "'Can't we wait a few days?' she asked. "'I am all unstrung. I have been through so much today.' Candler felt the hostility that emanated from each member of the party. It made him angry. "'We have waited as long as I intend to wait,' he said roughly. "'You have promised to marry me. I shall be played with no longer. I have the license, and here is the preacher. Come, Mr. Toosley. Come, Jane. There are plenty of witnesses. More than enough,' he added with a disagreeable inflection, and taking Jane Porter by the arm, he started to lead her toward the waiting minister. But scarcely had he taken a single step ere a heavy hand closed upon his arm with a grip of steel. Another hand shot to his throat, and in a moment he was being shaken high above the floor, as a cat might shake a mouse. Jane turned in horrified surprise toward Tarzan, and, as she looked into his face, she saw the crimson band upon his forehead that she had seen that other day in far distant Africa, when Tarzan of the Apes had closed in mortal combat with a great anthropoid, Turkoz. She knew that murder lay in that savage heart, and with a little cry of horror she sprang forward to plead with the ape-man. But her fears were more for Tarzan than for Candler. She realized the stern retribution which justice meets to the murderer. Before she could reach them, however, Clayton had jumped to Tarzan's side and attempted to drag Candler from his grasp. With a single sweep of one mighty arm, the Englishman was hurled across the room, and then Jane laid a firm white hand upon Tarzan's wrist and looked up into his eyes. "'For my sake,' she said. The grasp upon Candler's throat relaxed. Tarzan looked down into the beautiful face before him. "'Do you wish this to live?' he asked in surprise. "'I do not wish him to die at your hands, my friend,' she replied. "'I do not wish you to become a murderer.' Tarzan removed his hand from Candler's throat. "'Do you release her from her promise?' he asked. "'It is the price of your life.' Candler, gasping for breath, nodded. "'Will you go away and never molest her further?' Again the man nodded his head, his face distorted by fear of the death that had been so close. Tarzan released him, and Candler staggered toward the door. In another moment he was gone, and the terror-stricken preacher with him. Tarzan turned toward Jane. "'May I speak with you for a moment, alone?' he asked. The girl nodded and started toward the door leading to the narrow veranda of the little hotel. She passed out to await Tarzan, and so did not hear the conversation which followed. "'Wait!' cried Professor Porter, as Tarzan was about to follow. The professor had been stricken dumb with surprise by the rapid developments of the past few minutes. "'Before we go further, sir, I should like an explanation of the events which have just transpired. By what right, sir, did you interfere between my daughter and Mr. Candler?' I had promised him her hand, sir, and regardless of our personal likes or dislikes, sir, that promise must be kept. I interfered, Professor Porter, replied Tarzan, because your daughter does not love Mr. Candler. She does not wish to marry him. That is enough for me to know. You do not know what you have done, said Professor Porter. Now he will doubtless refuse to marry her. He most certainly will, said Tarzan emphatically. And further, added Tarzan, you need not fear that your pride will suffer, Professor Porter, for you will be able to pay the Candler person what you owe him the moment you reach home. Tut, tut, sir, exclaimed Professor Porter. What do you mean, sir? Your treasure has been found, said Tarzan. What? What is that you are saying? cried the professor. You are mad, man. It cannot be. It is, though. It was I who stole it, 
not knowing either its value or to whom it belonged. I saw the sailors bury it, and, ape-like, I had to dig it up and bury it again elsewhere. When Darnot told me what it was, and what it meant to you, I returned to the jungle and recovered it. It had caused so much crime and suffering and sorrow that Darnot thought it best not to attempt to bring the treasure itself on here, as had been my intention, so I have brought a letter of credit instead. Here it is, Professor Porter and Tarzan drew an envelope from his pocket, and handed it to the astonished professor. Two hundred and forty-one thousand dollars. The treasure was most carefully appraised by experts, but lest there should be any question in your mind, Darnot himself bought it, and is holding it for you, should you prefer the treasure to the credit. To the already great burden of the obligations we owe you, sir, said Professor Porter, with trembling voice, is now added this greatest of all services. You have given me the means to save my honor. Clayton, who had left the room a moment after Candler, now returned. Pardon me, he said. I think we had better try to reach town before dark and take the first train out of this forest. A native just rode by from the north, who reports that the fire is moving slowly in this direction. This announcement broke up further conversation, and the entire party went out to the waiting automobiles. Clayton, with Jane, the professor, and Esmeralda occupied Clayton's car, while Tarzan took Mr. Flander in with him. "'Bless me!' exclaimed Mr. Flander, as the car moved off after Clayton. "'Who would ever have thought it possible? The last time I saw you, you were a veritable wild man.' skipping about among the branches of a tropical African forest, and now you are driving me along a Wisconsin road in a French automobile. Bless me! But it is most remarkable. Yes, assented Tarzan, and then, after a pause, Mr. Flander, do you recall any of the details of the finding and burying of three skeletons found in my cabin beside that African jungle? "'Very distinctly, sir, very distinctly,' replied Mr. Philander. "'Was there anything peculiar about any of those skeletons?' Mr. Philander eyed Tarzan narrowly. "'Why do you ask?' "'It means a great deal to me to know,' replied Tarzan. "'Your answer may clear up a mystery. It can do no worse, at any rate, than to leave it still a mystery.' I have been entertaining a theory concerning those skeletons for the past two months, and I want you to answer my question to the best of your knowledge. Were the three skeletons you buried all human skeletons? No, said Mr. Philander. The smallest one, the one found in the crib, was the skeleton of an anthropoid ape. Thank you, said Tarzan. In the car ahead, Jane was thinking fast and furiously. She had felt the purpose for which Tarzan had asked a few words with her, and she knew that she must be prepared to give him an answer in the very near future. He was not the sort of person one could put off, and somehow that very thought made her wonder if she did not really fear him. And could she love him where she feared? She realized the spell that had been upon her in the depths of that far-off jungle, but there was no spell of enchantment now in prosaic Wisconsin nor did the immaculate young Frenchman appeal to the primal woman in her, as had the stalwart forest god. Did she love him? She did not know. Now. She glanced at Clayton out of the corner of her eye. Was not here a man trained in the same school of environment in which she had been trained? A man with social position and culture such as she had been taught to consider as the prime essentials to a congenial association. Did not her best judgment point to this young English nobleman, whose love she knew to be of the sort a civilized woman should crave, as the logical mate for such as herself? Could she love Clayton? She could see no reason why she could not. Jane was not coldly calculating by nature, but training, environment, and heredity had all combined to teach her to reason even in matters of the heart. That she had been carried off her feet by the strength of the young giant when his great arms were about her in the distant African forest, 
and again today, in the Wisconsin woods, seemed to her only attributable to a temporary mental reversion to type on her part, to the psychological appeal of the primeval man, to the primeval woman in her nature. If he should never touch her again, she reasoned, she would never feel attracted toward him. She had not loved him, then. It had been nothing more than a passing hallucination, superinduced by excitement and by personal contact. Excitement would not always mark their future relations, should she marry him, and the power of personal contact eventually would be dulled by familiarity. Again she glanced at Clayton. He was very handsome and every inch a gentleman. She should be very proud of such a husband. And then he spoke. A minute sooner or a minute later might have made all the difference in the world to three lives. But Chance stepped in, and pointed out to Clayton the psychological moment. "'You are free now, Jane,' he said. "'Won't you say yes? I will devote my life to making you very happy.' "'Yes,' she whispered. That evening, in the little waiting-room at the station, Tarzan caught Jane alone for a moment. "'You are free now, Jane,' he said, "'and I have come across the ages, out of the dim and distant past, from the lair of a primeval man to claim you. For your sake I have become a civilized man. For your sake I have crossed oceans and continents. For your sake I will be whatever you will me to be. I can make you happy, Jane.' in the life you know and love best. Will you marry me?" For the first time she realized the depths of the man's love, all that he had accomplished in so short a time solely for love of her. Turning her head she buried her face in her arms. What had she done? Because she had been afraid she might succumb to the pleas of this giant, she had burned her bridges behind her. In her groundless apprehension that she might make a terrible mistake, she had made a worse one. And then she told him all, told him the truth, word by word, without attempting to shield herself or condone her error. "'What can we do?' he asked. "'You have admitted that you love me. You know that I love you, but I do not know the ethics of society by which you are governed.' I shall leave the decision to you, for you know best what will be for your eventual welfare." "'I cannot tell him, Tarzan,' she said. "'He too loves me, and he is a good man. I could never face you nor any other honest person if I repudiated my promise to Mr. Clayton. I shall have to keep it, and you must help me bear the burden, though we may not see each other again after tonight.' The others were entering the room now, and Tarzan turned toward the little window. But he saw nothing outside. Within he saw a patch of greensward, surrounded by a matted mass of gorgeous tropical plants and flowers, and above the waving foliage of mighty trees, and, over all, the blue of an equatorial sky. In the center of the greensward a young woman sat upon a little mound of earth, and beside her sat a young giant. They ate pleasant fruit, and looked into each other's eyes, and smiled. They were very happy, and they were all alone. His thoughts were broken in upon by the station agent, who entered asking if there was a gentleman by the name of Tarzan in the party. "'I am Monsieur Tarzan,' said the ape-man. "'Here is a message for you, forwarded from Baltimore.' It is a cablegram from Paris. Tarzan took the envelope and tore it open. The message was from Darnot. It read, Fingerprints prove you Greystoke. Congratulations, Darnot. As Tarzan finished reading, Clayton entered and came toward him with extended hand. Here was the man who had Tarzan's title and Tarzan's estates, and was going to marry the woman whom Tarzan loved the woman who loved Tarzan. A single word from Tarzan would make a great difference in this man's life. It would take away his title, and his lands, and his castles, and it would take them away from Jane Porter also. "'I say, old man,' cried Clayton, 
I haven't had a chance to thank you for all you've done for us. It seems as though you had your hands full, saving our lives in Africa and here. I'm awfully glad you came on here. We must get better acquainted. I often thought about you, you know, and the remarkable circumstances of your environment. If it's any of my business, how the devil did you ever get into that valley jungle? I was born there, said Tarzan quietly. My mother was an ape, and, of course, she couldn't tell me much about it. I never knew who my father was. End of chapter, end of book. For the further adventures of Lord Greystoke, read The Return of Tarzan. Thank you for listening.